Okay, good morning and welcome to the last day of beginner overview training, day three. Um, we're going to go ahead and first thing we're going to do is kind of cover what we didn't get to on Wednesday, the, <clears throat> excuse me, those few things that we weren't able to cover. And then we'll go ahead and start with the day three topics, which are going to be the payments menu, the system menu, <clears throat> utilities menu, and then the reports. Um, if anybody has questions uh, during you know, the time, just you know, let me know and we'll go ahead and answer those questions. Or if you want to put them in chat, that's fine. I'll try to keep an eye on chat. Um, I think we'll go ahead and get started. So the first thing that we're going to do is go back, like I said, go back to Wednesday. Um, we were, I know Andrea was going over positions and I think someone had a question regarding the EMIS data on positions. So I'll go back to the position record and we'll kind of cover that a little bit. <clears throat> All right, so here we go. Uh, obviously at the top of the, of the position record, we have all the employee information, like the employee number, the position number, the description of the position, whether the job is active or inactive, terminated, et cetera. The pay group, uh, appointment type, building code, department code, extended service. Uh, usually that's only for uh, ESCs. Uh, FTE, higher date. Is this position a supplemental position? If it is, we would check the box. And then the start date of the position. We wouldn't really necessarily want to put a stop date on this position until they're actually gone or terminated. Um, and if they had a raise date, we could enter that information in. The retirement code is important. Um, if they do uh, qualify for retirement, whether it be SCRS or STRS, we want to make sure that that is defined in that retirement code field. Um, you can see we have options of none, STRS or SERS. The none may be for like student workers or things like that. But anytime you're adding a new employee or changing someone, if this field is left blank, I'm going to go ahead and save it. I think it should do it. Yeah. It gives you a warning. It says position saved with no retirement code. So that's kind of a heads up when they're creating or adding new the new employees, or even if they've made a change, uh, it's letting them know, hey, you didn't put a uh, retirement code in for this employee. So down the line, when you're processing payroll, you may run into an issue. So that's just, again, that's just a warning. It's not a fatal error or anything, but it does give you a warning telling you that. There is no position or retirement code in there. And then obviously a termination date. And then the supervisor option, the archived option. If this employee is uh, no longer there and you, they want to archive this position so it's not seen on the on the screen or on the, you know, within all the other employees on the position screen, you can archive it. Um, the eligibility flags are basically for the benefits if they're if they're eligible for personal leave, sick leave, or vacation leave. They will mark those boxes accordingly. Then we have the EMIS related information, and I know this. I think this is one of the things someone asked about. Um, obviously, the reportable to EMIS field is important. If this position is reportable to EMIS, they have to make sure that that box is checked. And then they have to define the position code and they can use the drop down to do that. Um, <clears throat> and then like if they know the name of the position code, they might be able to start typing in a few, few um, characters of the code number or the name and it may narrow it down for them to search and then select. And then the state reporting appointment type, they have to choose whether it's a certified position. Oops, hold on here, we have a question. Um, at some point, can you tell me where do you find the attendance days? I can't find them there, reportable to EMIS. Yes, we could definitely talk about that. Those would be coming from, uh, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. <laughs> Let me finish this here. So um, we're going through the state reporting appointment type, which is your certified classified internship or the veteran for Ohio revised code. You know, what is defined as a veteran? 
So they're going to choose the correct appointment type. The physician type, whether it's a supplemental, a regular, a temporary, they're going to enter or choose the correct position type. Physician status, that's basically asking what is the status of this particular employee's position? Are they normally it's a C, which is active continuing employee in the same position in the district, but you may have contracted personnel from an agency, so you could be using the A option. If they're on leave of absence, you would be using the P option. And then we also have the no longer employed uh, by the district in this position, which is a U. And that normally is only used, it used to be only used for employees that left over the summer months. Um, I think it still is. So just so you know with those position statuses, then we have the, the FTE or the full-time equivalents, or if, they're, they're special, if they teach special education, then you have to use the full special education full-time equivalents. The low grade and the high grade have to be entered what they're certified to teach as far as low grade, high grade. The separation information is only if they've left the district, they have to have, we have to have a reason and then a separation date. If they're, par if they're par a paraprofessional, you have to mark, yes, they're, um, they're a qualified paraprofessional. They're not, no, they're not, or it's not applicable. And then these fields here, these contract amount, contract work days, and hours and day fields are only used as like overrides. So like if you have, obviously you have an employee who has a compensation record with a contract amount, the number of work days, and then the number of hours in a day. If those are not wanted for EMIS reporting, maybe they want something different reported for EMIS, they would populate these fields because this takes precedent over the compensation for EMIS reporting. So if there's data entered in any of these three fields, it's going to be pulled into the EMIS side. If they're left blank, then it will it'll pull the data from the compensation record. And then we have a paraprofessional hire date, the building IRN, and experience uh, for the current class. We have assignment areas, which are, there's a drop down for choosing which assignment area this position is related to. The funding uh, source code, obviously there's drop downs for those as well. And then that would be, if once they choose that, they would have to choose the, the percentage for that one. And they also have a funding source code two funding source code three, and you can see that those also have percentages as well. The standard payroll, these are basically just like user, like user custom fields that they could enter information in if they chose, you know, to enter something in to keep track of something, they could do that. And the same thing for the standard personnel as well. There's text fields, uh, money fields, um, code fields, if they have a code that they want to enter in, keep track of, they can do that. And then they can run reports on those as well, on those different fields. And then the compensation and the payroll accounts on the position record all pull in from those particular records. They just pull in. You can't really do anything with them as far as making any changes to them. Uh, you can view them, like this one here, the compensation. I don't even know if that works anymore. I don't think it does. But basically, those are all just pulled in from the record, like the compensation record and the pay payroll account records. So it's just kind of all tied into this position record. Does anybody have questions on the position record? Like I said, I just kind of wanted to cover that really quickly. <clears throat> now, as far as the, the question on the EMIS attendance days, the attendance days basically are pulling from the employee, the job calendar, and that's based on what is, is set up for the employee's compensation record. Also, we use adjustments and we use the attendance record as well. So all of those play a factor into the EMIS attendance. Now, um, the district, you have to make sure that the district is set up correctly there's like a, uh, 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 I can't think of the name of it, but it's like an OECN, uh, and it defines what fiscal year you're currently in. If you're not in the correct fiscal year, it's not gonna pull in the correct attendance information, but I'm thinking 
that basically, Jamie, the question you're asking, if you if no attendance is pulling in or the attendance is wrong on the MISI for employees, I have a feeling that maybe something is not set up correctly for possibly the fiscal year. And I can send you the information that we have from EMIS as far as like what needs to be defined, especially if it's a, if it's a new district to a redesign, it could very well be that, that that might be the problem. Sounds good? Okay, cool. That's, that's what we like to hear. Um, the next thing that we're going to talk about is on the core menu, the position personnel. And anyone that has the personnel underscore user role will have access to this position personnel option. Now, what this basically is, is it's pretty limiting. You can see that because they can view it, view the records for positions, and they can also make modifications to those as well. Now, we talked about, I know Andrea talked about on Wednesday, we also have the employee personnel option as well. So if they have the personnel underscore user role, they should have access to the employer personnel and the position personnel screens. And they should be able to go in and, mod and view it and then make changes. They can also add absences and attendance. Uh, they can view date codes. They can, uh, again, modify the employee and, posi and position personnel records, and they can also view the leaves records. So again, that personnel underscore user role is very limiting, but they can basically go in and make changes to the personnel and the position records. Um, and they can also add attendance and absences. So if a district has someone that basically they just pretty much have them go in and add absences and attendance, and then also get want them to be able to make changes to like addresses for an employee or you know some some changes to the position record, the personnel user role is probably what they would grant them because again it's very minimal access, and they do have access to view you know, the leave screen and the date codes, but they can't make any changes. <clears throat> um, I know yesterday, Lori talked a little bit about the, the posting period option, and um, we'll just kind of revisit it really quickly. I'm not gonna go into it in great detail, but um, transaction dates. So like when they're, if you're using adjustments, the transaction date, requires the posting period to be open. It doesn't have to be current, but it has to be open in order to be able to enter a posting date or a, a transaction date. So example, like currently I'm in March, uh, current posting period, but I have February open. You can see that I have it open. So that will allow me to go in and add an adjustment with a February date. Now, if I had February closed and I tried to add an adjustment with a February date, I'm gonna get an error message telling me the posting period isn't open. Um, when we look at the posting periods, you can see this over here, ever since it started, it's always been a little confusing to me because you've got your folders. And so basically these are closed, these are open, and this is your uh, choice whether to make this posting period current or not. I prefer just to go over here and use the, the grid, use the column saying, is it open? Is it current? That just makes it a lot easier for me. Um, and again, like Lori said yesterday, the district wanted to be cautious as far as leaving posting periods open for a long time. I mean, their best bet is, yeah, like right now, I just started March. Maybe I want to, you know, post a couple adjustments or something into um, <clears throat> adjustment screen. In order to do that, I still have to have February at least open. So I can leave that open. I could close it and then just leave it open to be able to add those adjustments. But whenever you close the posting period, like Lori said, it fires a report bundle for the end of that particular posting period. 
So you want to make sure because if you re may remake it current and you close it again, it's going to fire off those reports again. So you just have to be kind of cautious with that. <clears throat> um, obviously, we have the create option in posting period, which allows you to create a new posting period. You can select the month from the drop down. You select the under the year, and then you tell it whether it's a, it's the current posting period or not, and then you you create the record. Now, the only thing is, like Lori had mentioned yesterday, you can only have one posting period be the current period at a time. It won't even let you. I mean, if you go over here, if I went back and made February my current posting period, you'll see that it refreshes the screen and it changes my posting period back to February. So now you can see that March is not the current posting period, but February is. I'm going to go ahead and change that back. <clears throat> um, one thing, and we'll, we'll talk about this usually at fiscal year end, but um, we like I just like to mention it. Before the district starts running the first pay of July for their new fiscal year, um, they want to make sure that they had completed the SCRS advance reports and the submission. And then normally we always make want to tell them to make sure they run, run the wage obligation report, which we'll talk about, as well as the benefit obligation reports. Again, we'll talk about those later in the report section. But those are three things that at uh, the end of the fiscal year and before the first payroll in the new fiscal year, we want to make sure that all three of those processes have been done. And again, that'll be revisited, you know, at the fiscal year end meetings, but just kind of something to keep in mind. And then the last thing that we didn't get to cover on Wednesday is a dashboard. And what we call the dashboard is kind of like, uh, it's a functionality of the, an employee dashboard showing all of the screens for a particular employee. So if I wanted to see an employee's dashboard, I would go to this area and find that employee by name or ID number, whatever they choose. And when I do that, it pulls up what we call the dashboard. It touches all of the objects for an employee. And you can see those over here. <clears throat> you don't see employee. Employee information is found underneath the, the employee ID. So if I click that arrow, you can see that I, I can edit the employee record if I needed to. So maybe I needed to change the address or something. I could go in here and do that and then save that change. <clears throat> you can see we have an employee photo. We have an option for photos, but it's not working very, real well right now. And um, that is something that I, I think that our developers, you know, are more, um, they want to work more on the nitty gritty of, of the programs and what affects, you know, the payroll and reports, et cetera. So that's probably something that's not quite high up on the list, but eventually you will be able to see photos. I know some districts have loaded them. You can load them, but they've said, hey, this person's photo doesn't go with the name. It, you know, there's just some, some issues with the, the photos right now. Um, and then down here, you can see the employee's name, the address, and the city, state, and zip. Then we have the positions record. So if I click on positions, you'll be able to see all of the employees' positions over here. And you'll notice we have the include archive option as well. So if this employee had any archive positions, I could click that, they would pull up. And then you can see here, so we have the advanced query. We've got the report option, just like we have you know, on the, on the position record. Uh, we have the more option where you could choose more um, Op, or more uh, grid options. So maybe we want to include the employee social security number. We can do that. It'll then show up on the grid. And then you'll notice, and this is one of my pet peeves. I hope someday we can fix it. Anytime you make a change on the grid, it basically refreshes, meaning you have to go back and click on the object that you were in. So you can see now I added the social to the grid. It's right here. And then you can see we have the view 
the modify or delete, which we don't want to delete. Because if you deleted one of these records, it would just be archived. You, you can never really delete the record. There are some records that can be deleted. So like say that you create a brand new um, position record and it was never tied to anything, that should be able to be deleted. Um, I'm going to add something. We had a ticket regarding that. I'm going to add something to the documentation because one of the developers did give me some information regarding like if you deleted something, if it would truly go away or if it would be archived. I'm going to put that out in the deck, maybe out in the uh, appendix. That probably probably be the best place for it. So that again, that's you know the position object. Then you've got your compensation. And again, these look just like the under the core, but it's defined down to one particular employee. So like all of the compensation records appear on this screen for the employee. The leaves for the employee pull in, and you can see the leaves and the accumulations tab are available for this employee. So I could see what, how many accumulations and when they, the accumulations took place. I could run a report on it if I wanted to, or the leaves. I could look at the employee's leave information, you know, how much sick leave they have, vacation. This one obviously is just eligible for sick and personal. So you can do that. We've got the pay distributions object, again, on the dashboard showing, you know, what, what the employee's pay dis distributions are. And you can see it looks just like the core menu, but it's just narrowed down to one particular employee. This is something we don't have on the grid or the core, sorry. But this is the payment screen, which is related to all payments that this employee has, has been paid. Now, what I can do is I could click on just the employee, you know, maybe that pay date. It'll pull up breakdown detailed information regarding the payroll for that particular pay date for that employee. It gives the, uh, the information as far as like uh, the, the check number, whether it was a check or a direct deposit, the dollar amount, when it was issued, the status, the position that was paid on, if there were more than one, it would list all of them, the description of what this pay was for, what account they were paid, uh, the, the uh, employee was paid out of, then all of the payroll item information as far as what was paid by the employer, what was paid by the employee, if there were uh, error adjustments and additional monies paid, those would be pulled up over here as well. And then it tells you the, the OD, ugh, can't talk here, all the information regarding the grows. So it gives you a lot of information. If you're familiar with classic, it's very similar to the browse screen. Uh, that's kind of what I refer it to as the browse screen. But again, it gives you a lot of information um, regarding the employee's payments, how much they were paid, et cetera. And you'll notice here as well, when we talk about payments today, um, you can actually go in to that particular individual employee's record and you can void or unvoid or print. Like Lori showed you yesterday, you can actually print out the, the check or direct deposit right from that employee's record. So just so you know that that is out there and it's available. Um, there's the attendance. Again, this is only for this employee's attendance. You could actually add an, an attendance right in here in this employee's record, or you, know, you can view uh, the attendance information. You'll see that there's the mass change option. And that all stems from core, but it's just breaking it down by employee. And the last one are the payroll items. So all the payroll items related to this employee are listed underneath the payroll items. And again, you can go in and you can make changes. If you needed to add a new payroll item for this employee, you could just do it under the dashboard instead of going into core and, and adding it. You could do all that here. You can see I have the include archive. It's checked. I'm just going to uncheck that. Um, I don't. Remember, I don't think we're archiving payroll items yet, but we might be. Um, let's see. We have a question here. Pop out that detail information. Um, I'm not sure on that one. Carol is asking if there's an enhancement request to pop out detail information for payments. I 
we may have one out there, but I will bear, I'll check it and verify it. If we don't, I can always add that if that's something you would like. Hard time looking at the payroll item info or payment if they have a lot of items. Totally agree with you on that, Carol. I'm right with you on that because again, <laughs> you have to scroll down, you know, like if they have a lot of items, just like even this employee did. <laughs> I'll go back, but I totally understand. And not only that, but like I had to, you could see I had to go to the bottom of the payroll items in order to be able to scroll over to the right to see if there were any error adjustments or anything like that. So um, I will definitely do some checking into that. If there is not one out there, I will, uh, I'll put one out there for that. That, cause that's definitely a good question. But yeah, you can see right here, like I can easily see, you know, this information, but I can't see anything over here to the right. I have to go clear down to this little scroll button here in order for me to be able to go back up and see, you know, if there were any error adjustments, if the, you know, any employer error adjustments. So yeah, I will definitely make sure that if we do not have one, I will add one. Let me write that down so I do not forget. Okay, all right, perfect. All right, so now, are there any questions on anything we just covered, the positions, position, personnel, dashboard, or posting periods? All right, we're gonna go ahead and just dig right in then. We're going to go to payments. So the payments menu is up here, again, with all your other menu options. I'll go ahead and click on payments. And the first thing that we'll talk about is check register, but kind of wanted to tell you that payments, they can be used for a variety of functions. Uh, we have a check register, as you can see, we have a manual checks, payee checks, payroll checks, and refund checks. So there's several different options listed under the payments feature. So again, we're gonna go to check register first. <clears throat> so check register will allow you to reissue, print checks, uh, resequence checks, reconcile, unreconcile, or auto reconcile checks. So there's a variety of options that you can use when you're in check register. So if I wanted to reissue a check, I could do that via check register. Um, the only one thing we have to make sure of is it's a paid check. It's still a status of paid. It's not reconciled or voided or anything. So um, I could find that check by going in and find, you know, entering the check number. So I could just uh, do equals. Let's see, I gotta find one that's paid. Nine oh four seven three. Okay. So here's the check not the check that I want to reissue. Okay. So I can go in and click the box next to that check. And then I can click the reissue option. And again, like Lori said yesterday, we always get that bank account option. If the district only has one bank account, then they're gonna use the bank account, the only bank account that's listed. They have more than one for some reason, they're gonna to have to choose the appropriate bank account to use. The new check number will automatically be populated when we do the process of confirming the, the reissue. Um, the reissue date, I'm just gonna go ahead and choose today's date. And then when I know that I'm ready to reissue this check, I'm going to go ahead and click the confirm button. And when I do that, I get a message telling me that check 90473 was reissued as check number 900477 with the reissue date of 311, 2022. Then if I go back in and look at that check register, I can see it voided that for that 90473 check. So if I go in here, I should be able to see the new check number for $150 that was created today, which is right here, 900477 for $150 with the issue date of 311. So I reissued that check today. 
So that's how they can reissue a check if they need to. Uh, the next option is maybe we need to now print that check out. So to print that check, I again, click the box next to that check, click on the print checks tab, and then it gives me the option whether I want it in XML format. And normally that's what's used in most of the printing softwares. Some may use the PDF, but nine times out of 10, it's the XML, like an export format. So I'm just gonna leave that as XML. And then the file name is already default to checks.xml. So if I click, if I wanted to get out of here, I could just click done, nothing's happening. But I wanna process this payment. I wanna actually create a file that I can save and then down, upload to my printing software so I can print that check out. Hold on here, let me get out of there. So if I pull that check up, the XML file has been created. I will save this file to a folder of my choosing and then upload it to my printing software. The next option we have is resequence. So if I wanted to resequence the checks, let's just say that um, three of these checks got jammed up and then when they were printing them out and they need to have those checks resequenced with new check numbers, we can do that. So let's just pick, mm, let's just pick these three. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and I just selected them for my own good. So when I'm going in, I can see the check numbers easily because I will tell you when we go in to resequence, again, it's asking you for the bank account, but you have to enter obviously the original starting check number. So I'm gonna choose 900473 and the ending 900475. The new starting check number, if I hover over this, it's telling me it can't be null. This is one area where you have to enter a new starting check number. Most of the other options will allow you just to leave it blank and it'll assign the next check number available. Here, it will not. So you have to go in and physically say, hey, I wanna start out with 90478 because I can see here that 90477 was that last check that I, that I created. Now, if I wanna avoid those old checks, I need to check this box and say, yeah, I wanna do that. And then I have to enter a void date. So I'll just use today's date as well. So what I can do is I can validate this first to see, to see if this is really what I'm wanting to do. If I click validate, I should get a box up here. Whoops. Let's see, what do I want to commute? Oh, I must already have one voided. I do, I, that's my own fault. I chose a check that was already voided bad mistake. So let me uncheck that one and let's check this one. Now we'll try again. All right, so we'll do the same thing. We'll check, enter in the starting check number. Oh, We're gonna avoid all checks, now I wanna validate. And see with the validate, it was kind of nice because oh, it told me it gave me another error. Uh, oh, I didn't put a date in, a void date. That is probably why. We'll try it again. There we go. That's what I like to see. So it's telling me that it's going to process three checks. Um, it's going to void those checks and then create the new check numbers for these. Uh, checks that we want to basically resequence. So if I just go in now and click the post option, it's going to void those three old checks and give me another message and told me what it did. It voided the old checks and created the new checks. So now I can see those three checks have been created <clears throat> with new numbers and the other checks were voided. <clears throat> we also have the capability of reconciling checks. 
Now, if I wanted to manually reconcile some checks, I could go in, obviously, again, have to make sure they're paid. So I could just go in the status and filter for any checks that have been paid. And then maybe I need to, I'm going to go ahead and reconcile manually these checks. So I have, have them marked. And all I need to do is click on the reconcile option. And the reconcile date, it's giving me today's date. If I wanted to change that and make it 228, oops, and then click the reconcile button, I can do that. And then it tells me, hey, five checks are reconciled for a total dollar amount of 1139.51. Now, if I want to see those checks, I can just look for reconciled. They should be the ones right towards the top. They are. Okay, so now let's just say, oh, I didn't want to reconcile those. Those are the wrong checks. I could go back in, click the boxes next to those checks that I reconciled, and click the unreconcile option. When I do that, it unreconciles those checks on the fly. So basically, I'm just going to go ahead and get rid of this because what happens is I don't get any pop up boxes or anything. It just automatically unreconciles those four checks that I had initially reconciled and then I unreconciled. So basically, it took care of unreconciling them automatically on the fly. Now we have an auto reconcile option. I'm going to go in first and show you how you set up a format for the auto reconcile for pay rec. And to do that, we need to go into utilities and there's an automatic payment reconciliation option. Kind of jumping around, but we have to in order to cover this. So right now I could see there's a bunch of different formats already out there created. So I've got a format called Lori's format. If I click load, it'll load it for me. I have a training format. If I click load, it loads it and shows me what fields I have selected here. If I was needing to create a brand new format, maybe you have a district that doesn't use auto reconcile, but the bank is going to start sending them a file that they can actually upload to reconcile their checks, you know, uh, quickly, automatically. They can go in and create a format that follows the banking format in order to do that. So the first thing that they have to do is make sure on the pay rec tab. Then they can choose uh, the import file type, whether it be CSV format or fixed length format. So I'm going to choose the CSV format. So now what I can do is go in here. Whoops, I did that. And let's say that this bank wants the check number first in the first column. So we choose that. Then we can go down here. This is a really good example because I'm using one that's already out there. But we'll, if, if a district didn't have any formats at all, they would go in and click this plus button, choose a check number. Then they could click the plus button again. You'll see it adds another field, but I'm just gonna go in here. So the second, let's just say they want the date. Then they want, the check amount. They want, um, let's see, what do they want next? The payee name one, two, maybe they want the payee's address. And then I'm going to add another field because they want, if there's anything voided, they want the void flag. And you'll notice this length and format already populated. I mean, usually nothing needs to be changed unless for some reason the bank has a request for something different. They can change this, but the length they cannot change. Okay, so say that they have this format set up. This is following what the bank's format is on the file that you're going to receive. They could go in and click this save option, and then they could call this whatever they want to. So like, hey, Rock, 311.22, and I'm gonna save that. Now, when I save it, it puts it under these save formats. So that means I can go back every time I want to, uh, 
I don't have to, so let me go back. Once I've got this created, I don't have to go back in here. It's already created unless I'm creating some new format. That would be the only time I would have to go back in here to do that. The other option while we're in here, I may as well show you this, that way we're not going back and forth, is the pay rec extract. And a pay rec, pay rec extract is basically creating a file with paid checks that you could take and upload to the bank. So the bank knows, hey, these checks are sitting out there with the paid status. They have not been reconciled yet. I'm sending this to you so you know, hey, Eventually, these checks are going to be coming in. So you could create a pay rec extract file as well. Again, the district has to work with the bank so they know the correct formatting that's needed. But they can go in and choose the format type, CSV or fixed, and then they can go in and choose the extract fields. So maybe the bank doesn't want the bank account first. Maybe they want the check date first, and then the check number, and then the check amount, whether it be decimal or amount, whichever, however they want it, and then the payee name. So that's how the, they want that, that record. If they wanted to add another field, they could just click this plus button. Maybe they want the payee two. Maybe they want payee address. And maybe they want the bank account. What else do we have here? And maybe we do allow for spacers to be in this file as well. It works similar to how USAS has their set up. And then maybe we'll put the void check in here. So now we have our format all set up. Okay, so the check date basically meaning um, any checks that were created on this date and on are going to get included in this file if they have a, a status of paid. So I know in this district, I, I will yesterday, we have like files from like August that are showing as paid. We're gonna choose the bank account and then which transaction type? Do you want just payroll checks, deduction checks, group deduction checks, refund of payroll items, or do you want them all? We'll just choose the all. And then this allows you to generate a report first before you actually create the extract file to send to the bank. So I'll just go ahead and create the report. And you can see, like I said, because I use that August 21 date, we have lots of void, we have voids, we have paid checks. But this is what all is going to get included then on that extract file. So if I go in now and just click the generate extract option and save it, then it's going to give me the file that I can take and upload to the bank. I save it somewhere and then I can upload that to the bank. And I pulled up over here, but I'll pull over here. You can see it. And then again, this is what's going to get uploaded to your bank for your extract. So those are the two um, pay rack extracts. Uh, or pay rack and pay rack extract options. But we're going to go back to payments check register because now we digress. We'll go back to the auto reconcile option. Now that we have a format out there, we could go in and click on the auto reconcile option. And when we do that, okay, we got a file from the bank of all these checks that came back to the bank. Well, now on our system, we want to reconcile those checks. We're using auto rec, auto reconcile. So what I can do is I can enter the reconcile date. It defaults to today's date. Which format do I want? Remember we created the format out there in utilities in the auto, auto uh, rec option. So we're gonna go in and choose a format that we wanna use. The format that, th that matches the bank's format. And then the bank account, again, it just uses the default unless they have two for some reason. So then I have to go in, I have to choose the file that the bank sent to me in order to be able to do an auto reconciliation. So I'm gonna go ahead and choose this file. Before we do that, I will show you that file so you know what we're actually going to be reconciling. 
here to, I've got three checks, 9004676665, and 65, the dollar amounts of the employees' names. So when we auto reconcile, we should be able to go back in and see that those checks were reconciled. You know, before we do that, let's go back in and let's do nine, oops, nine oh oh six. What was the numbers? And gee, short memory, can't remember the numbers. Six, five, six, and seven. Okay. Oh, four, six, five. Okay, so what I did, I filtered on the grid. I wanted those three checks, so I did 900465, two dots, because I want to go from this number to this number. So it actually pulled all three of them up for me. I can see right now their status is paid. Okay, so now let's go into the auto reconcile. I'll go back in here and choose my file again, because I wanted you to actually see what we were going to be doing. I'm going to go ahead and upload this. And when I upload it, I get a message telling me three records were processed, three reconciled checks gives me the dollar amounts, the total reconciled. If any checks failed when I was trying to do the reconciliation, it would have told me how many checks failed. I think it would have given me the check number and the dollar amount too. So then I could download this summary if I wanted to, so I could save it you know, to a folder or something. But when I go back out to check register, those three checks, you can now see that they have a status of reconciled. So I reconcile those checks automatically using the auto reconcile option. Anybody have questions about that? Okay. Now let's go back to payments. Let's see, I gotta get up to date here where I'm at with my PowerPoint, I kind of jump ahead. Okay, so we'll go back to payments. The next op option is your manual option. Okay, the manual option is used to enter, like, to create like just manual checks for employees. You can't, or employees or payees or other. Keep in mind, you cannot process a payroll check through here. That has to be processed through the whole payroll program the whole payroll processing, but an employee check can be processed. Maybe um, an example, you have an employee who had a direct deposit to their checking account and a direct deposit to their savings account. The bank sent you a, a, a money back for $150 because that employee's savings account was closed, okay? You could use the manual payments option using the employee option to give it a check for that $150 to the employee. The same thing can be done for payees. Maybe um, you create a payables check out in, when you were processing your payables for $500 and one employee was included. Well, you wanna make the check right, you wanna correct it. So you're going to basically um, go into pay, manual payee option and make that check $450 instead of 500 because it should have only been 450. Then you can always make adjustments to the employee and to uh, the air adjustment to the employee for the later date. But the only problem is like Lori said yesterday, you have to make sure when you're running the next payroll that you, you correct it because you don't want to short the check again you know, um, when you're making the, or processing the check for the next payroll. So that's just something to keep in mind, but it can be done. And then the other option we have is um, the other option. It's called other. I should click on create so you can see them. Employee check, payee check, other check. So an other check could be used for maybe uh, moving interest from the payroll account to another account, maybe to a use as account. So you could create a check, cut that check for now and then take it to the bank. You could do that, uh, you know, using this other option. So I'll kind of go in and show you how all three options work. So again, like the employee check option, we need to cut a check for the employee for $150 because the savings account was closed, the bank returned the $150 to us. So I'm gonna find the employee, find him. 
bank account. It all, already defaults to the next available check number and it defaults to today's date. You want to change it, you could. And then for the dollar amount, we got to put 150 because they sent it back. I. So just a brief description of a memo, like what are we cutting this check for? So once I've done that, I could save it. And I save that check. So now I could go in to this manual payments checks, checks option. And that the $150 check that I just cut for him is out there. I could click on that and use the prints checks option. And you can see a, a pattern, like one from check register. All of these tabs are similar. So again, I would go into print checks, create the XML file, get the file, save it, and then upload it to my printing software. Now we'll go back to manual check option, payee option. This one looks a little bit different because we have to select the payee first. You have to find your payee. And then when you do that, it pulls up the different payroll items that are associated with that. Now, that's not a good one. Hold on, let me pull this one up. Okay, so we need to go in and short this check. Initially it was $500. So we're, we voided that $500 check, we voided it. We're not gonna send it. We wanna create a check for the right amount. So we're going in and selecting the payee, selecting the configuration option, the bank account, again, the check number is defaulted. Now we got to go in and just put in the dollar amount that we want for the check. Okay, we just put a, a memo in there what, we, what we're creating this check for. Get information message telling us that it created that check successfully. Again, we go back to manual payments checks. We could go in. And we could check the box. We could print that check out. Same way we would do for the employee check. And the same thing is true when we do the other option. When I go to other, it basically asks for a name and then the street address, city, state, zip. And then obviously if it's not a foreign country, if it is a foreign country, you have to mark it and then put the, prov the province and the country in. And then, the default bank and check number automatically populate the dollar amount and the memo line. Maybe you know, transfer of interest to other account. You can do that and then go back in to manual payments and print that check out as well. So that's how manual payments works. There's three different options, three way, three choices, three ways of doing things. And then this manual payments tab, manual payments checks tab, obviously is to print those checks out once you've created them, okay? The next option we're gonna to go to is, hold on, I gotta go back because there's one thing I didn't talk about in manual. And again, similar to, to check register, we have the void and unvoid options just like you do in check register. So let's say I didn't want to create this hundred or this $150 check for Brent Hurst. I could void that check. And you can see it's the same pattern, looks the same, just like check register, voiding the check. It voided it, put it in a void date. If I wanted to unvoid it, I would choose that check, click the unvoid tab. Now it's unvoided. So again, all of these payments options are very similar. Uh, obviously, check register has several more because of the auto reconciliation and reconciliation, but um, you'll see the pattern once we go through. So, like the next option is your payee. So, the payee has three different tab options we've got payee payments, which are your check and direct deposits, your payee payments checks, which are just only your payee checks for your vendors. And then the payee electronic transfers, which would be only your electronic payments made to vendors. So if I click on the payee payments tab, 
Um, I will see all of the, again, I will see all the payments made to the payees. You can see we have a void and unvoid option. That's all we have out here. So if I wanted to void uh, a payee check, I could do that. Uh, I have to find that check or that transaction. So let's see if I can find one here. Okay, so I pulled this one up and I want to actually void that. You can see right now it's not voided. It doesn't have a voided date. Voided option says false. So I'm going to go ahead and click the, the box next to that check. Click void. Choose today's date as the void date. Confirm that. And then it voids that check for me. And then if I want to unvoid, same thing. Select the check, unvoid. On the fly, it automatically unvoids it. Okay, if I wanted to go to the payee payments checks, if I had to reissue a check, a print a check, or resequence a check, again, falls in the same pattern of the check register, same options. So I could go in, let's see, I don't want to reissue a reconciled check. Let's go in and reissue a paid check. So let's just reissue that one. And you can see it's all the same features. It's just you're you're doing it with different check options. Yeah, there. Ooh, all of a sudden it's got got laggy on me. Okay. So you can see it, it reissued this check to 23336 or 26 up here. And then if I wanted to print it, a same thing, choose the check and then the print option. If I needed to resequence some check numbers or check number, I could do that by just selecting the different checks and resequencing. The last option is your electronic payments option. And, and the electronic payments options, all you can see we have are a reconcile and an unreconcile option. And so you can see, We've got many that were already reconciled. I'll also try to find any that were paid. You can see all of these out here that are paid, but they're not reconciled yet. So I could go in manually, and if I wanted to, I could reconcile some of these payments just by selecting them, clicking reconcile, then it would recon put a reconcile date in there, today's date, or whatever date I chose. Same thing, if I had reconciled them, I want to unreconcile. Just click the unreconcile option. It unreconciles those checks immediately. Okay, our next option under other payments is your payroll option. In your payroll option, we have, again, we have the void, unvoid, and print payment checks and direct deposits. So um, if you want to void a check, obviously have to make sure it's a paid check. You go in and, uh, yeah, it's not already voided. You can go in and void it. You can go in and unvoid. You could print. So if I wanted to go in and print a check or direct a, a paper direct deposit, I could do that just by selecting the check. Um, I'm not sure. We'll try this direct deposits XML. Let's just see. It gives us a paper direct deposit. I think it should, but. We'll find out. Yeah, it gave us, nope, it gave us the XML file. Okay, so we could take the XML file, transfer it over to our printing software and print it out. I'm wondering if we chose the PDF option. If it would, yeah, because it's giving us an option for the form file. So we can do that and then go in and print this off. Maybe. <laughs> Come on, there we go. Yeah, so there's your paper direct deposit notice. Okay. So again, those are that's the printing option under the payroll payments. Then after we have that, we have the void on void and printing. We have your direct deposits. So let me go into the direct deposits tab. 
If you wanted to reissue a direct deposit as a check, you can do that by just going in. Um, let's do this one, selecting it. And then clicking on the reissue option. My computer all of a sudden has gotten really slow. Okay, then we want the reissue date, put today's date, confirm. Oof, kind of slow. There we go. Now it gives you this option to, uh, for the payroll check. If I want to print it, it gives me that option to do that. And which format do I want? We'll use the XML. Because like I said, most printing softwares use the XML file. We'll save that. Pull it up. Again, you would save that file to your folder and then upload it to your printing software. All right. Our other option is for the direct deposits, you have the capability of reissuing it as a direct deposit simply by going in and clicking this down arrow. And when you do that, um, it'll pop up with the, employee, with the employee's account number and the routing number already defined. So all you need to do is click on the generate file option. Now, the only problem, like Lori talked about yesterday, you may have, the district may have to contact or work with their bank and talk to them because with this, it may work because they're just reissuing a direct deposit that was already a pay date that, that, that was already defined probably for the bank. If not, I mean, you at the ITC may have to help them like change the date on the file in order for the bank to accept it. But this is basically the file that they're going to get that they can re-upload to, upload to the bank. And then that would go into that employee's account. So we do have the option to reissue a direct deposit as a direct deposit. Now, in, in classic, you never did. It was just, you could reissue it as a check. Okay, and then the last option we have is the payroll payments checks. And you can see, again, we have the options to reissue a check, you can print a check or you can resequence a check or checks. It's the same, um, same format, same way of doing it as other um, payments options. So it'd be the same thing. And then our last option under payments is the refund. Now, yesterday, Lori talked about doing refunds. And again, um, you could go in and, you know, create a refund by doing an error adjustment, and then the refund payments will be sitting out here. And you can see we have the capability under the refund payments. This is all, whether it be an electronic transfer or a check, you have the capability of going in and voiding and unvoiding a refund payment or what we added not that long ago was because, and this is really nice because before when we did refunds for an employee, maybe they got refunded money from an annuity that they shouldn't have paid into. Well, obviously when that happens, um, if, if it's an annuity, nine times out of 10, initially taxes were not withheld. So when you do the refund, taxes are withheld from that check. Um, and the thing about it is before, we had nothing to really go on as far as like what was basically withheld. You had to go out and look at the get adjustments. Well, now we have what we what we call the detail report. So under the refund payments, if you select the check you want to look at, you could go in to the detail report and actually see, you know, the dollar amount that was refunded, how much was withheld for taxes. Yeah, right here. Here's what happened. This this. Well, this is a good example. I just messed around with this, but this was your refund information. These are all the taxes that were withheld from that refund payment. So we have that out there now, which is really nice. You know, you could print that off for the employee if you needed to. Um, we have the refunds checks option. And again, under the checks options, same, you have the same features, reissue, print, 
resequence. The refund ACH option, you have the reissue option just like you did under the payroll. So if I did the reissue option and the date, and I confirm, this is going to print. And again, if I wanted to, whoops, this one obviously is a check or it's voided, but I could have done this as a direct deposit, just like I could have under the payroll. So you have the capability of doing a check or the direct deposit. The choice is up to the district, how they want to handle that. So that's basically all of the payments information as far as all the different objects that you can um, use. Are there any questions on those? You guys are so quiet today. <laughs> okay, um, let's see, what are we gonna talk about next? So the next thing we're gonna talk about is the system menu, all right? And the system menu basically, it contains programs that control how uh, processing is defined. So maybe like what is defined or how things are set up. Um, normally, as far as like who can, make any changes to this. Usually it's only administrator access that would be able to make changes to that. Um, but the system option allows uh, you, the user to turn on modules, which may be needed for processing, and also enter configuration information as far as you know, ways that certain things are, are needed to be set up. Um, and then obviously to view or edit, uh, you have the, the uh, modify button to click, and then we have the, like save button, just like we do in any other program. So the first thing I'm going to talk about in system, I know this is a little, it sounds a little weird, but I'm going to kind of skip and go to the modules first, because a lot of times under the configuration, if I went to system config, configuration first, and it's just because it's an alphabetical order, but I really wanted to talk about the modules first because if certain modules aren't turned on, you can't configure them. So obviously we're going to talk about modules first and then we will talk about the system module, the configuration modules. All right, so I'm gonna go, as I said, to the modules first. Now you can see over here to the left, all of these, have like minus signs, negative signs, okay? So let me refresh this because I was playing around with this this morning. Oh, let's do that. I'm gonna go in, I wanna uninstall all of these. And you can see when I change those to pluses, None of those modules are installed. So I'm going to refresh. And then, okay, we had talked about, I know Andrea talked about on Wednesday, like the EMIS contractor module. If I went out to core EMIS entry, right now, the EMIS contractor module, it's not available. It's not there because that module is not turned on. But there are a lot of other modules too, because Across the top here, we're going to see when I turn on these modules, some of these modules add menus to the top of this, of this uh, menu. So let's go back into modules. And right now, just kind of keep note of, this, of these options up here. I'm going to go in and turn on the USAS integration module. And when I do that, and if I refresh my screen, you'll see I have the use as integration module out there now. Um, another module is the workflows module. And that's something we won't get into uh, you know, a great deal today, but I will just kind of touch base on it. But if I turn that module on, you'll notice it gets added to that menu at the top. Um, another option I wanna talk about are these employer distribution modules and employer retirement share module. Obviously those are both 
normally housed under the USAS integration tab. Right now you can see they're not there. And one other place that they're normally located are under the reports because usually you want to run employer distribution report, employer retirement report, you know, if they're using um, uh, their foundation for their retirement payments. But right now, we don't see those reports listed under here at all, either one of them. But if I turn on those two modules, whoops, hit the wrong one. <laughs> and if I refresh the screen, I should be able to go to reports. And now I can see the employer distribution module or employer redistribution report, employer retirement share report. I can also see under the USAS integration, the employer distribution submission option, employer retirement share submission option as well. Another option, same thing, which, which would go to the reports as well as the USAS integration, because right now you do not see leave projection under here. Same thing under reports. You don't see the leave projection report option. But if I turn that module on, oops, hold on here, and refresh my screen, I will then see both of those options under reports right here, under USAS integration right here. We talked about the contractor module. <clears throat> this, e this email notification service option, that is basically used um, for when you're processing the payroll. When you're processing the payroll and you want that email notices option to be available, this module has to be turned on. If it's not turned on, you will not be able to process email direct deposit notices. But with this, with this module turned on, that email notices option is, av is available when you're processing payroll. We have the file archive module, and that basically is found under utilities normally. You can see right now it's not there. Hold on, I gotta scroll down here a little bit. Oops, here we go. So when I click the file archive module and refresh it, I should then be able to see it out. Let's see, under, what am I doing here? I'm going to the wrong place. There it is, under the file archive. You'll also notice that when I, I install that module, the file import op, mod, uh, mod, or, yeah, module also came into effect as well. All right, I'm just gonna go ahead and let's see, let me add here. I'm in place. Okay, so let's go back to the, this file storage module and the file storage management, management module, they're all related to the file import and the file archive capability. So normally we just tell everyone, just go ahead and turn those on. Um, and then let's see what else we have here. The HTTP notification service module, needs to be turned on in order for the email direct deposit notices to be sent. This file transfer notice services, the FTP, SFTP, and FTPS uh, can be turned on as well. And the LDAP directory authentication, which is the lightweight directory access protocol, um, it's a software protocol that enables anyone to locate data about a, an organization or an individual or other resources like files or devices that are in the network, whether they're on a public internet or a corporate internet. So if um, your district is wanting to use that, or if the ITC wants to, the users to authenticate to an external L LDAP service, 
that module would need to be turned on and installed and configured in order for that to work properly. So I'll go ahead and turn that one on. Oops, just so when we go to configuration, we can see the configuration. Um, keep in mind that this is kind of an, a technical issue. So your ITC technical people would probably need to know, uh, they would probably be doing this setup with this, but I just wanted to make you aware that that is a module other that has to be turned on. We have the mass change service, which turns on that mass change button on a lot of the core menu options. And I think Andrea talked to you a little bit about that. Um, we have the leave projection module. Um, and that we talked about, never mind, we already talked about that. I'm, I'm looking at my, my PowerPoint and not thinking clearly. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we go. The tax estimator module. Um, if the district would like to go in, maybe they have an employee or employees that say, if I changed my, um, my, you know, my withholding, well, obviously my uh, exemptions, obviously if they're doing that, they're going to have to create a new W-4, which means that they're going to have to use the new W-4 taxing option. But if they wanted, if they use that and they wanted to see like what kind of, kind of an effect something would have on their taxes, this tax estimator will actually do that. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it on again. We'll talk about that later because that is found under utilities. Um, and then this Windows Active Directory service authentication is used to externally authenticate users. Um, this configuration is where the ITC tech department would enter, they would have to enter the necessary information uh, for to communicate with their Windows um, LDAP server. Again, this is kind of a technical area. Your, your tech people may need to be involved with this. All right. So I basically have everything turned on, which is good. Now we're going to actually go down and talk about, what are we gonna talk about? <laughs> we're gonna talk about the system configurations. So let me scroll down to that. I get to my PowerPoint here. Um, I can find it. Okay. So we're gonna talk about system configuration. There we go. All right. So we go to system, go to configuration. And you can see there's a lot of different configuration records out there. Uh, the first one that we're going to talk about is the account mapping configuration. I'll click on that. So what that configuration allows you to do is determine how much detail they're going to want for the benefit accounts um, to be included. So um, right now they're paid out of a salary account, but when they're charged benefits, that goes out of a benefit account. Here, they can determine how much of that uh, salary account they want to use on a benefit account. Benefit account. So maybe, maybe they only want the OPU to be used. So they could go in and just select use OP, the operational unit. So when they do that, that's going to carry forward when they're posting their benefits. So like their fund, function, object, 200 object, then whatever the OPU is, that's all going to carry over into the benefit account. That's what that account mapping configuration is used for. And again, whenever they go in and make a change to something like that, they have to make sure that they save that change so it is retained. The advanced sick leave configuration is basically used to allow districts to set up a time period. So if they want to uh, allow employees to use advanced sick leave, so maybe they give them five days of advanced sick leave, um, they would go into the leave screen and put an advanced amount of five days on there. But then what they have to do is determine when they want that to be reset. 
And how they do that is by going in and using this period options. So if they choose fiscal year um, on July 1st, because that's the beginning of the new fiscal year, all of those advanced uh, amounts are going to be reset back to zero. If they choose calendar year on January 1st, all of those advance amounts are going to be reset back to zero. Or they can enter a custom period with beginning and ending dates, however they want to do. So it's up to them how they want to handle that if they're if they're allowing advanced sick leave. Um, this pay, advanced payoff option basically is set up if they want to uh, allow the advance uh, to be available more like more than once. So if they check this advanced payoff box. That's meaning that the advance is always available. And when they do accumulations, that those will decrease the advanced units that were used in the leaves. And it's gonna allow that employee to reuse the advanced sick days during the period that's selected, you know, whether it be fiscal calendar or that specific period that they have defined. If they have it unchecked, that basically is meaning that it's only available once and accumulations do not affect the advanced units, of, un, units used. And in the leaves, the employee is only allowed to use the sick advanced days during the select period one time and that's it. So if they had five days and they've used all five of those days, no more are available, they can't use it anymore. That's what that advanced sick leave configuration is used for. And I'll show you real quick on the leave screen. I'm talking as far as like the advance amount right here. They have the capability of going in and setting up, you know, they want to give them a max amount of advance amount of five days. That's where they're going to actually enter the days in. And then the, the configuration just um, determines, you know, when they're reset and if they're able to use them more than once or not more than once. That's what that configuration is set up for. The next one, the authentication and password requ uh, requirement configuration. Normally, this is set up usually when the district first um, migrates in. Um, I haven't, don't know too many districts that want to change it. They can if they want, but it be administrator only. They can make changes to this, and um, they could basically go in and say, "I want the minimum length of the password to be 10 and require a mixed case or require numeric numbers to be in the password. And they could you know, set the password lifetime. Maybe they want to set, reset after 60 days. They want to have them reset after 60 days. They can do that. Uh, the pre-expired passwords option um, is used like, let's just say that district had an employee who forgot their password. Well, they called the administrator and said, I can't remember my password. Well. The administrator, they went out to that user. They went to the user screen and they went to this little key and they went in and created a new password and, and verified it for that employee, okay? They told the employee, hey, here's your new password. You gotta change, when you get, you gotta go in and change that password because what that pre-expire option means, let me go back to it here. What that pre-expired password means is the, the administrator is changing it, but that's requiring the user to change that password on their next login immediately. Um, if they don't, they may have to, you know, if they get, get logged in using that password that the administrator created for them, they, they're probably going to get kicked out the next time because that pre-expired password is set up. Basically meaning they should have reset the password after the administrator gave them a, a temporary. Um, the pre-expired password option, it does not affect anyone that holds an administrator role, only employees that don't have that administrator's role, it will affect. Okay, the next option is the check void message configuration. Um, this will be really great. Uh, unfortunately, right now it's not working. We do have a JIRA issue out there to get it fixed. Again, this is probably not something that's on the top priority list 
um, but we do have an issue out there to fix it. Um, and when uh, this is actually fixed and corrected, this will actually allow the district to put a message. Oh, you know what? Hold on. Well, never mind. This works. I'm sorry. Void message. Yeah, void message works. I'm sorry. This was for another message that you wanted to put on here. On the, uh, I think it's, hold on. Let me go. Let's do some investigating here. I made, I put something on here and said, this isn't working. I want to make sure because if it's not working, I want you to know that it's not working. Here we go. Nope, you know what? It is not working. I did not lie. It is not working right now. So unfortunately, you can't put any, you know, vo no void after 90 days or whatever will be showing on the checks. Um, but it will eventually be corrected. It will be fixed. Phew, glad we got that taken care of. <laughs> okay. Um, the next option is your deferred absence posting. And deferred absence posting configuration is basically set up if a district wants to be able to go out and enter like future absences in attendance without affecting the balance today. So like if they go out and let's say they went out and added attendance entries for April and May, when they do that, it's not going to affect the balance at all. Not until that date actually is included in the period beginning and ending dates of a payroll. Then it will change the balance on the, on the leave uh, employees leave. But the deferred absence posting is an option that can be used. Um, you have to be a little careful with it because sometimes people start using it and they're like, I don't really like this. And when they stop using it, sometimes it's a, a little bit of a problem because you know, if they had posted a bunch of absences out there, yeah, they're never going to get pulled in if, you know, they stop using the deferred absence posting. So you just have to keep that in mind that when they are adding those absences, if they're in deferred, it's not affecting the leave balance at all. So just keep that in, in mind if they talk about wanting to use it and maybe check out the documentation go over it a little bit more, make sure that's really what they wanna do. The next option is EMIS reporting configuration. And the, the EMIS fiscal year needs to be updated every fiscal year. So obviously you can see, um, I just did this yesterday, but I did update the fiscal year to 2022. On um, the reporting ID, really district should never have to do anything with this because that reporting ID is being used in conjunction with the student software. And so what it does, it matches up right now. This is using credential ID. It matches up the credential ID from payroll to the credential ID on the course records. And if someone went in and made a change to this, there's going to be a problem with EMIS and USPS matching it would be an issue. And then the ZID prefix is the prefix found after the ZID, and that can be found in the um, OEDS prefix file. That's from uh, OBE. Those are, those are given to each district, the ZID prefix given to each district. And again, that's something that probably would never need to be changed once it's installed, once it's put on there. The email configuration option, um, in order for that to be available, again, there was a module back in the modules that we had to turn on in order for this to be available, which we did. Um, but you have to have this set up when you're doing email direct deposit notices because that default administrator office has to be something that is associated with the district, like their actual you know, email address. So maybe like the payroll person's actual email address. Uh, the default from address, address is a true email address of the sender. So again, this could be my, you know, your own email address or the person that's sending the direct deposits. Um, 
The Enable Star TLS is an, e an email security protocol. So that box should be checked if the district has an MS Exchange Office 365 with SMTP auth authentication enabled. That's the only time um, that box should be checked is if they had that set up with that those features. Uh, the password, the district obviously would know the password, you know, based on what their uh, their uh, server their server settings are. Uh, the port uh, is uh, again something that your tech people will probably be able to help you with. And same thing with the SMTP ho uh, host. That's going to be like your server name. And then the username is, a, uh, again, something that tech people may want to give you. They may know what the username should be um, that is set up on this email configuration. So again, this is something that, they, that you may, you or the district may need to work with their tech people on in order to get this set up appropriately. The email direct deposit notice configuration option. Um, again, that's set up for email direct deposits as well. And the from email address is going to be the person that's sending the notification. So maybe it's, uh, you know, miller at sse-ohio.org. Um, the subject is automatically defined. It has a direct deposit notice for and the, the date in, in parentheses, but it automatically pulls that date from the payroll file. And the body of the message, it just tells you attached to this message is your direct deposit notice for the date of the payroll. So that information is basically also defaulted as well. Then at the bottom, we have a send notifications to all addresses. So if on the employee record, they have more than just one email address up. So maybe they have their work email address, then they have a home email address, and maybe they have their husband's email address, all three of them. If they have all three mar all three set on the employee record, and this flag is marked as true, then when the direct deposit notice is sent, it's going to send, all, send three. It's going to send the, the work, the home, and the husband. All three of them will get that. So that's what that, that flag is set for. Excuse me. The employee number automatic generation configuration is used uh, for automatically assigning uh, employee ID numbers. Um, this can be configured to allow the employee ID to default, obviously, so they never have to manually enter in the employee number again. Once that's in place, it's going to cause employee ID numbers to be assigned automatically. Um, the default employee ID is generated based on the highest employee ID that's currently on the file and on the parameters defined in the employee number automatic generation. So if you have a number out there that's a high number, let's just say, you know, I don't know if you, I, maybe your district never used them. Um, you could set this up to actually uh, start assigning them um, based on the uh, Increment the number of letters. The number of letters would be from their last name. So, like, do you want two letters, three letters, four letters from your last name? So, like, I, my name would be M I L L. Then um, the starting value would be zero 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 seven seven. So it would actually allow. It would give up to nine characters. And then with the way this is set up right here, that's how it would do. It would use. Um, the starting value, the number from my last name, four, M-I-L-L, -L, then the starting value would be 77. And then you can see it's going to increment by seven. So if there was another M-I-L-L, -L, it would probably be, let's see, 77, 82, it would increment by seven, so it would be a four. Yeah. So they want to do something that uh, makes a little bit of sense. That doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but... That's basically what they would be doing. Um, they can increment any new numeric value from zero to 100. Um, if the field is set to a value other than zero, the employee ID will be generated using the value set as the increment 
when duplicate numbers are encountered. Um, if it is set to zero, it's going to force the ID to be manually entered. So you have to keep that in mind. Uh, the number of letters we talked about that can be from anywhere from zero to four. Uh, the starting value, numer numer numeric value, can uh, range from zero to nine, 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 nine. It provides a starting number value for the IDs. So basically, uh, the number is going to be used uh, for the first unique number assigned, and then it will increment, you know, by the incrementing number that they have defined. And then the, the employee, use employee IDs option allows the employee IDs to be different than the social security numbers. So you have to use a set configuration to automatically generate employee numbers. So basically when you're, when this is checked, it's saying, hey, we're using the automatic generation option. So every time a new employee comes in, we're going to automatically generate a new employee ID. OK, the next option is the employer retirement share configuration. And Lori talked about this yesterday. What this is is basically when districts are running employer retirement share distribution, if they want um, only pay account or want only accounts that are marked as um, use employer distribution. If they want only those accounts pulled in when they're running that report or that pro that process, they're going to make sure want to make sure they have this box checked. If they don't care, if they just want everyone's, whether they're marked or not marked, they would leave that un unchecked, unflagged. Um, let's see, the fiscal year configuration, uh, be, th this basically tells what fiscal, what when their fiscal year starts. Most school districts are July. I know we had an ITC that said they had a school district. It was really strange, like their fiscal year, it, it wasn't even like calendar year. It was like very, very strange. Um, so they, they could basically go in and select, you know, what month their fiscal year actually starts. And again, this is something that once it's set, set it and forget it. I think that's kind of what we would want to say. Um, let's see what else we got here. This LDAP directory authentication, we talked about the LDAP module. Um, again, I think that uh, if districts want to use this, you're probably going to have to have them uh, work with their tech people in order to know how to populate all the information that needs to be populated on these fields, you know, as far as using an external authentication. So they need to have the, dist uh, the district tech people be involved with setting up the LDAP configurations. Um, this last account transaction configuration, has, it gives you a timestamp. It's going to update every time a new account change transaction is found in USAS, and it's synced with USPS. So every time a new account or something happens with an account, there's a pay stamp that gets it gets stamped out here when the accounts are synchronized with you with USAS. The ODJFS configuration basically allows you to mark whether or not the district is going to be submitting their own file to ODJFS. Um, if it, the reason that's out there is because if they're going to submit their own file, that file will have headers and trailer records on it, like it does when they just send you their regular file and you have the ITC append and do all the, the processing that needs to be done to it in order to send it to ODJFS. So if your district is going to be submitting their own files to ODJFS on the source, this box has to be checked. And then these fields also need to be populated as well, as far as their transmitter name, the phone number, the extension, and then the transfer email, who's actually submitting the file. That all needs to be populated. Oops. Um, Let's see. 
The overtime object code configuration is basically used um, if the, the district wants the overtime pay type to swap the object code defined in the configuration here. So basically they have a object code defined for overtime in this a configuration record. Um, if they're paid overtime, they're going, the object code will actually be swapped to use this object code for account charging. And you'll notice there's certified object codes and uh, classified object codes for retirement uh, purposes. So certified and classified. Then there's certified non-contributing and classified non-contributing. Those are for no retirement system. So basically if it was a student or someone like that, it worked overtime. We will be using these object codes instead. The payment printing configuration. Um, if they're using a check printing default form file, that would be listed out here. And then they have a, uh, the opportunity to select the number of pay amounts they want listed on the check. You know, whether it be miscellaneous, regular, accrued, et cetera. Then the number of payroll items that they want to be able to have listed on the check. And the number of positions that they want to have allowed to be on the check. Um, let's say that they have an employee that has 10 different positions and they have a five in here. That means that only the first five are going to get printed on the stub and it's going to ignore the rest unless they have this check to use overflow page. If they have that checked, then um, the overflow, overflow page is going to use a separate eight and a half by 11 sheet and it'll list all the pay types that did not fit on the check stub um, and the payroll items and the positions paid. Those will all be listed on that overflow page if that overflow check overflow use overflow page is marked. We have the combined accrued and regular wages option. Uh, had a lot of controversy about this off and on. And I know we've had, we have a ticket out there right now that um, if an employee has negative, hold on, maybe it's docs. I can't remember. If, no, it might be negative accrued. If they have negative accrued wages on a pay, they want that to actually show on the stub. So we have a JIRA issue out there, you know, to, to add that or to fix it. But this combined accrued and regular wages option just will pretty much take the regular wages and to combine the accrued wages, whether they be negative, positive, whatever, and just put all of them on one line as regular wages. Um, so if they want that, they would make sure that they have that box checked. If not, when they get their checks up, it might show the regular wages and then it would show the accrued wages, you know, whether it be negative or positive, it would show that figure. So just to keep that in mind, that's what that is for. Then we have the direct deposit form, form. And again, if they had a custom direct deposit form file that they were using, it would be showing under here and they could default that to be their form custom form file. Um, then we have oops, the direct deposit pay amount limit. So basically how many uh, pay amounts are there allowed to be on the direct deposit? And then the direct deposit payroll item limit, same thing. How many payroll items are allowed to be listed on the direct deposit? And then the direct deposit position pays, um, how many position pays are allowed to be on the direct deposit. So that's kind of the setup of your printing configuration. And again, this is probably something that once they have a set up, they really won't do too much with it unless they want to add an overflow page or they want to combine the accrued and regular wages. Okay, we're going to stop. We're going to take about a five minute break. I actually was going to stop at 1030 but that didn't happen. So um, let's take about a five minute break, stretch, go to the restroom, get a drink, whatever you want to do. And we will come back here at about, oh, let's say about 1051.
And we'll pick up where we left off.
Okay, we're back to business here. Um, we're still in system configuration. We're going to talk about the rounding configuration next. And the rounding configuration has an account rounding threshold, which is uh, used to uh, set up the allowable amount that's going to be charged to pay accounts for rounding adjustments. So that needs to be set up for pay accounts. Then we have the contract payoff rounding threshold. That's going to be basically set the threshold when you're paying off the contract obligation uh, as far as rounding, uh, wh what do you want that to be set as? And then the last one, the unit amount decimal positions, um, it sets the rate rounding preference for the new contract program. So we need to have that set up as well. So again, your districts, if they're new, you just wanna make sure this is set up appropriately. The next option is the STR advanced configuration. And basically at the fiscal year, uh, this is set. So like once they run the STRS advance, the advance amount is set to what the advance amount over the summer months is going to be. And that advance mode flag is set. And then every time they run a payroll and monies are uh, accounted for for, re for the STRS, that dollar amount is going to go into the amount paid back field. And then also when they submit the advance file, now we have a submission timestamp that's actually going to be showing on this uh, record. So they will know, the district will know if they look at this, when that file was actually sent because it'll be timestamped. Uh, the next one is the STRS configuration. And what happens is if the state minimum salary for STRS is changed, we always send out a patch. The SSUT sends out a patch and they basically send that to you and then it's loaded and then that will get updated accordingly. Uh, we do have a field on here, it's called base withholdings on earning. So if the district um, bases their withholdings on earnings, that box needs to be checked. And if that's the case, they don't normally don't have an advance uh, in the, in the uh, summer. But that field is available there on that screen if needed. The transaction configuration is basically uh, showing you the highest transaction number. Um, instead of using the highest number retrieved from the database, it's actually showing the highest number that's available out there. So this is kind of helpful when you, if you need to uh, eliminate gaps in your transaction numbers. Uh, so if you put in a ceiling, so basically the highest check number, if you put in a ceiling, um, when searching for the next available check number, the numbers greater than or equal to the configuration are going to be ignored. So um, an example, the district has, let's just say the following check numbers showing up in a uh, check register, say 1,000, 1,001, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3, then it jumps clear to 20,540. What they could do is they could go in to this edit transaction configuration. If they entered in 20541, because that is the highest number out there, um, what's going to happen is it will basically allow the, the ceiling will be out there and the highest check number is going to be ignored. So if you entered uh, that two, 20541 in, the, in here, when you process the checks the next time, the starting check number will then start at that 10004 you know, continue in that same pattern, following those same numbers. So you're basically setting a ceiling here. That's what you're doing with this configuration. That way um, you can kind of get back on track with your check numbers. Um, let's see, the USAS configuration option. This is basically done at the beginning when you're setting up the district um, pulling them, putting them into redesign. And there are um, things that basically have to map these, these API codes um, and application IDs. Those have to be set up accordingly on the USPS side and USAS side. They have to basically work together. 
But the one thing that I wanted to show you on this screen is we have a nightly use as account sync option. So if you have that set, get it checked, you could have you could set that up and then set a Chrome expression. So basically the Chrome expression can be, you know, I want this to run every night at four o'clock in the morning. Um, there's a, a site you could go out to to learn what current expressions are and how to set them up. But that's what you could do um, on that nightly uh, sync. You could set it up to run a, a specific time every night or, or every other day or however you want to set it up. You could actually go in and, and do that. Okay. Uh, the next option is the W2 configuration. And again, we have the, the districts have the capability of submitting their own W-2s. If they're going to be doing that, they need to have this box checked. And then the company information, the contact information, and the submitter information here all need to be populated. Now, the submitter name and address, if it's the same as the company, they can just check this box and that will populate. But all of this information needs to be populated in order for that to work correctly. They have to have all this information in when, when they're submitting their own W-2s. And then down here, we have the workflows configuration. And again, workflows are something that are fairly new. Uh, what workflows are used for is, is, we call it like onboarding. So basically it can be used to, uh, to create a new employee, to pull a new employee in. Um, if they want to use an employee onboarding, they can check the box, save it. Now, the only other thing is there are other things that have to be set up on the technical side. And we have documentation out there as far as like workflows and what all needs, needs to be set up before workflows will actually work correctly. But I want to say workflows, if you remember when we looked at the dashboard, it kind of works similar to that, um, except it actually gives you a little bit more because it won't let you continue on, you know, until you you basically said, yeah, I've completed this record, I'm done with it. But it's kind of like a, a system where you create the employee, then you start and you complete, you know, you create each record that's, that's in, uh, in uh, the list for that employee. So that's kind of what onboarding looks like, but. I, that will be more probably in our intermediate training. So I'm not going to go into great detail about it, but we do offer that now. And it is nice. We've got several ITCs and some districts that are saying that they really like it. Um, so we have some bugs we're trying to, you know, or people send us suggestions saying, hey, you know, I'd like to see this. Um, definitely, we're doing that. We're trying to, you know, make it uh, as user, user friendly as we can. Um, so that is definitely an option that's definitely available out there. Okay, the next thing available under the system menu is this custom field definition. And the custom field definitions, you could create a custom field definition and put it like on the employee record or the position record or um, trying to think wrong, pay distribution record. But I'm going to create one just so you can see what I'm doing. I'm going to put it out in the employee record under the dates field. So I could go in here, hold on, I gotta pull this over, that's driving me crazy, there we go. I'm gonna go in and, and click the create option. And then I had to tell it what type of, of field I wanna create. So it gives you a lot of different options, codes, dates, email, um, you know, money, number, text, user, whatever you wanna create. So I'm gonna go in, I just wanna use the date. And then what a record is this gonna to apply to? I'm gonna say it's gonna to apply to the employee record. I wanna put it on the employee record and I passed it. There we go, there it is. And then I'm gonna click continue. When I do that, I have to put a display name, like what do I want this to be called? I'm gonna say, um, Lori's. Okay. And then you can see the, the type already pulled over. The order is, where do I want this in the date? I mean, if there's several dates, do I want it at the end? If I want it at the end, I just leave it at zero. 
But if I want, want it to be the first day out there, I would put one. I'm just gonna leave it as zero. And what a record is it applying to the employee? I want, this is gonna be active. I actually wanna see this. And then the property name. So what's the property name going to be? This could be used as like a report. So I'm just gonna call it um, Lori Box. And then what group is this going to go into? Now on the employee record, I think there's a dates group. So let's just call it date. I think it's dates. We'll go back and make sure. Yeah, we'll find out in a minute. So I saved this. So when I go out to the employee record, I should be able to go into any employee. And see, oops, put it right here. Oh, the, yeah, these are dates that are already defined. But it actually, this is just a custom date. So it put the date right here under the dates category. Now, if I wanted to move it over here to be the first one, I should be able to go back into it and change it back here. Um, change this. this is number one. And the nice thing about this is you will actually be able to see this in the grid. So let me go back to the employees record. Pull up the employee. I should have moved it. Yeah, I moved it right over here to the first thing up available. I'm just going to put a date in here and save it. And then, like I said, I should be able to go to the grid. And let's see, where are you? Maybe. Hold on. Got that. Uh, hold on. I thought I was able to see it. Maybe that's just the dates themselves and the dates option. I was thinking for some reason. Let's see here. Maybe not. Yeah, right here. There we go. Under date. That just had to go to the right place. So if I wanted to choose that, show it on the grid, I can do that. Just have to be smarter than the system, right? And then if I want to do a report, I could do that and it would pull that into the report as well. There we go. But again, it doesn't have to be a date, it can be anything you want to put in there. So here's here's my Lori's test box date that I put in there. So again, you can see that on the grid, you can run it in a report. So it's kind of helpful. Again, it can be a text, it can be a boolean, it can be a lot of different things. Whatever you choose to do it on, on several different, there's several different options as far as where you want, like screens that you can put it on as well. Um, let's see. This DBA is just mainly used for SSDT as a bugging tool. Uh, we just use that to, to see if we can find bugs. So well, you probably won't be using that a whole lot. And then let's go down to, let's see here. We'll go to monitor next. And again, the monitor, as far as like the like ITCs, the really only beneficial one that you'll probably be, probably be using would be this app log because a lot of times you can find errors. And if there's errors, there's, the, oops, hold on, there's one, where is it? Oh, let me do this. Then you can actually go in and try to determine, you know, what the problem is. This kind of helps you determine where there's an issue, where the problem is. Um, the other one might be, let me see, which one is it? Remember server log. No, that's not it. Hold on, let me find.
that one. Like I said, this event, the status, a lot of these, you can, you can look at them, but they probably won't make a whole lot of sense to you. Um, I'll talk, kind of talk about them just real briefly. We're not going to go into great detail on them, but the, the events option under monitor uh, gives you the ability to view various types of events that occurred in the system. So you're, you can look at um, flow metric events, recent repository, uh, slow queries, life cycles, recent exceptions, recent audible events, and recent metric events. Uh, again, this is kind of more on the technical side of things. So I'm just gonna, I just wanted to show you this screen so you knew where, to, where it was at. Um, the status basically shows information about the status of the application and jobs and installed modules. Uh, and each job that runs during the import and import process along with the various modules that are installed and listed and they're listed here with their values. So again, this is going to give you, you know, a little bit of information, maybe when you're doing um, applications or jobs or installing modules, maybe out there to help you with that. The metrics, um, they have, the system has a built-in monitoring system. So um, a useful, uh, one in the monitoring is this metrics option. And we do have like a, an actual whole um, guide on using the system monitor options. Um, actually, let me, let me do this. Let me pull that up and then I'll put the link out there. That way, maybe if I can get it to work. Come on. Open, there we go. Yeah, I'll pull that up. Um, I'll put this this link out on the chat just in case you want it. You can like look, you know, view it because, like I said, this kind of goes through all of the system monitoring stuff. I just put that out there on the chat so you have it just in case. Um, let's see, what do we got next? Oops. Click the wrong button there, made everything go crazy. All right, the logging. Um, that displays the name of each object in the application that has logging enabled. So you can see that here. The grid shows the effective logging level. Right here shows the level, the name, the level, and the effective level. Um, I have another, I'm going to put this out there as well, open this up, and I'll put this link out here as well. This is for authentic authentication troubleshooting, and I will put that link out in the chat as well in case you, know, you want to look at that. There'll be some uh, nighttime reading or something when you can't, can't sleep or something, so. <laughs> um, We'll do. All right, then we have the app log. And again, that's the one that I told you may be beneficial for you at, at the IETC. And I know a lot of you have probably already looked at this, maybe even used it, um, but it does help you maybe figure out what the problem is, uh, why the district's having an issue. So that's a good one for the ITCs to be able to access. The threads option, it just basically lists, you know, the group, CPU time state, Damien, and Alive. And again, this is something that is more um, SSDT related. They can use this more, more for troubleshooting questions. Uh, the admin log lists uh, information like the name source and preview. Um, that is the log, this is the one I was looking for. When you're doing your importing of the districts, you could look out here under the admin log to see information regarding um, your import. It would be out in this in here. 
Uh, and we do have that um, as part of the post import procedures. And then um, obviously in our post import procedure, we have uh, the common import errors and uh, import fails with column mismatch errors. So we have all that information. This kind of all helps, helps tie in with that when you're doing your importing. Uh, the info basically lists the category name, value, and type information. Um, again, this is more of your technical information as far as your Docker files, your JVM information, and it contains uh, detailed information about the configuration files. So again, it could be more of your technical people or uh, developers, programmers, or people that are setting up your Docker files. The server log um, contains downloadable links to various log files that are related to the application and the server that it's running on. So they may be able to, to download if you, you know, your server using something in of the Catalina, you could download that file and download information regarding that. It may be a, a benefit, a helpful tool for them to be able to pull that up. And the next option under system would be your roles. And the roles basically define what basic functions or responsibility or tasks that an employee that a user can use. Um, employees or users can be granted more than one permission. So like you could grant someone the general manager role as well as like some other role that you created. You could definitely do that. And you can see in your roles, you have view, modify, and the delete option. Um, the roles are basically defined by your district. Like they tell you, you know, we want this person to have this kind of access, et cetera. Um, maybe you have a treasurer, you want him to have certain access, and the accounts payable person to have something else and payroll, they have something, some other kind of access. All of those can be set up. Maybe you have an EMIS coordinator. They have to have special, you know, different uh, user or different um, uh, roles to be able to get into the EMIS data. <clears throat> and you can see, if I go to the administrator role, you can see all of the different options that are available. And you'll notice here, like, uh, let's do this one, the module admin, there's, that's like the top, higher, top of the hierarchy. So if I granted this to the user, they would have the capability of admin viewing. That wasn't a very good one. Let me get a different one. Here we go, custom fields. <laughs> so if I gave someone this module custom fields, that's the higher, that's the top in the hierarchy. So basically meaning if I gave them that, they would have all of these other custom field, create, delete, report, update, and view roles. They would, or options. They would have all of those in one if I grant them just that. That, that. that one basically gives them access to everything. If you only wanted to break it down and give them access to certain options, you can do that just by double clicking it, moving it over or clicking on it and then click, clicking the arrow to move it back. The next option under rule of system is rules. And um, various types of rules are applied on the fly. Uh, if you create a rule and then activate it, you have to make sure, you know, you say we activate it. Um, the, the payroll system already comes with its own set of required business rules, as well as some optional ones that may be enabled or disabled. If they're bundled, that means it came in the USPSR option, and more than likely, you're probably not going to be able to disable it. If they're mandatory, that means you can't disable it. So let's just go in, uh, let's go into a warning here, because I know a uh, warn when the personal label go. Okay. So we'll open this one up, all right? This is a warning to tell you that the user's personal leave balance is gonna go negative. So right now, this one isn't set, it's set default. It was bundled, it was 
so it was pulled in. If it was mandatory, I wouldn't be able to change it, but I should be able to go in and enable it and validate it. When I do that and I save it, you'll see now that it changed that rule from false to true. I was able to make that change. So now that rule is set for my district. So when they go in and if a per, an employee has personal leave that's gonna go negative, it's just gonna give them a warning and tell them that. So that's kind of what the rules are. And again, your ITC could create your own rules if you want to, but there are a standard set of business rules that come with the USPS program. They're already out there. Um, the next option is the system user. And the user is basically the employees that are assigned to, uh, to use the system with, their, with the certain roles that they're granted. So to create a new user, you just click create, type in a username, um, put in the person's name, and then if you want to put their title, um, do that, their email address. And then what permissions are you granting that employee? What access, what roles are they allowed to have? And then are you gonna set an expiration date when their account expires? We'll, we'll set this, we won't set that. But when the password expires, expires maybe you wanna set that for three months in June. And then we want to make sure that it's enabled. You can see that it's already defaulted. If it's if the lock shows, like if you have an employee that's already out there and it shows lock, more than likely they probably tried to log in too many times and they couldn't get it to work. So that's why it's locked. You may have to unlock them, an, an administrator. And then if you're using that LDAP, that external authentication, you may need, you'll probably need to mark this box accordingly. And then the last login will show, you know, once they started logging in. And then if the account expired, it'll actually be a be checked. You know, the system recognizes that. And then if the password expired, same thing, it'll be checked. So if the user says, I can't get into my account, the administrator could go into this account, look at it. And if they see this is a check mark with a check mark, that's the problem, the password expired. So they could go out and reset this date because more than likely they probably forgot to reset their password. So that's the thing that they can do. But when they, they're going in and creating a new employee, they can just enter the information and then click save. And that employee is then out there. And then what the administrator can do to get them started is to go in and hit the key and set up a, a temporary password and then give that password to the employee. And then once they log in, they're going to have to create their own password. But that's a way that they can actually go in and get started with your user account. Okay. Um, let's see what else we got here. And then the workflow integration. Um, again, this is part of the setup. There's some behind the scenes data that has to be set up. And let me get the let me get the uh, the workflows guide. I'll, I'll put that out there for you as well. Let's see if I can get it to come up. Open. Oh, there we go. Uh, let me get that. Happy. Put that out in the chat for you as well. You have that information. All right, so we went through system. Now we'll go through utilities. The first option under utilities is the account mapping. And account mapping, if you're familiar with Classic, it's similar to Classic. If they had account mapping in Classic, it should have uh, imported it into redesign. Um, but what they can do is map benefit accounts Maybe they have a benefit account that's charging to one account or it's going to charge to one account, but they don't want it to, char to charge to that account. They want to charge it to a different account. So they could take the original account 
account and enter it in here under the original account fields and then put the account they want to charge it to in the mapped account. And then in order to do that, in order to add another mapping, they could just click this plus box down at the bottom and they could enter the information, the original account here, the mapped account here. And once they've done that, it'll save it down at the bottom. And then what they could do, I'm gonna get rid of that. They could do a reorder. So I could just go in and drag, let's just say I wanna move this one up here the top. I could just click that reorder and drag it and drop it. And it moves it up to the top. Or maybe I want to move it back down to the bottom. I can do that. Because, I'll, whoops, I didn't do that. Something happened there. A lot of times, well, we can't move them down. We can only move them up. That's strange. I have to check that out. Um, a lot of times you'd like to have your mapping set up like uh, more specific at the top and then less specific toward the bottom. That way, you know, your more specific accounts get looked at first and then the less specific uh, get, get looked at after the later on. Um, again, this is a remove option. So if I wanted to remove this account, I could just click that X and it's removed, it's gone away. And then again, if I was adding one and saving, adding it, once I've added it, I need to click the save option, make sure it's saved. Okay. Um, the next option under utilities is the attendance absence import. And Lori touched on this yesterday quite a bit because when we were talking about um, payroll and using the option to import absences or attendance, that's what this is for. Um, they basically just go in and choose your file whether it be absence or attendance. And again, the attendance has to be in the correct formatting. Um, even though they're not using a column, it still has to be in there as a space, a place setter. So just keep that in mind. Um, and then, you know, uh, if they have a location on their, their file, they have to make sure that it, they specify if it's the building area or the department code. If they don't have that building, they just leave it as none. Do they want to post to uh, payroll? So whether, if they want to add the attendance information that they're importing into future all at the same time, they could choose the post to future option. And then do they want to combine attendance entries? So like maybe you have an employee who's on the spreadsheet 10 times, you know, because you work 10 different days. If you selected combine attendance entries, it would, it would combine all of those entries for the payroll into one entry in future. And then this a negative leave balance will only be used for absences. And then if you're entering attendance, um, which payroll account do you want to charge to? Do you want to charge to the account that's defined for the employee for that sub? Or do you want to charge it to the account that they're actually subbing for? Most time they just use the account that better set up for the positions, but it's up to the district. And then you just use the import option. And when you import, you get the ATT error. Again, if there's errors on that report, there may be, you know, five errors. You would just go into that file, that CSV file, make the corrections on that file, and then go back in here. And when you choose the file, you're choosing the ATT air file that you made those corrections on. That way you're only loading those five records, not reloading all of the other records that were on the initial file. Okay, let's see what we got here. And we talked about this earlier, the automatic payment reconciliation. We talked about using the pay rec and the pay rec extract options. So we're not really gonna have to go over that because we kind of already covered it earlier. All right, the change password option. Um, a user can go in and change their password by going into that utility change password, type in their old password actually looks like it already pulls over. Then they just have to put in a new password, verify the password and then click change password. And then they should, have a new password created. Their, their, their new password has been created, I should say. 
Okay, let's see here. Uh, the next option is the file archives. And the file archives, you can see, we have four different tabs. The payroll archive is basically going to give you all of the payroll reports from every payroll that has been processed, as well as like your calendar year end reports, fiscal year end reports, monthly reports, um, your SERS, STRS, anything we like re referring to the payroll. It's all going to be pulled in there. Uh, one thing I, I would like is if when you go into it, the most current year will pull up to the top. That's going to be on the wish list, I think. But that would be one thing that would be really nice. But again, if I wanted to go in and take a look at a payroll report, something related to a payroll, uh, I could go in, click on that payroll report uh, folder. And then here, I only have one payroll process, but I can see the direct deposits that were created. Well, I could go in and download that. And I can actually see the direct deposit file, if I can get over here. This is my direct deposit note notices. So basically, let me go back into a different one. Let me select something else. That was payroll payments. I should have went to per pay. These are all your per pay reports. Again, every time the payroll is processed, these reports get created and put out into the file archive. So if I wanted to look at a pay report from February 15th, I could just click this download option and it's going to give me that report from that time frame. Go ahead and pull that report up. Maybe, <laughs> come on. It's not done. There we go. So this report was the February 15th payroll report. And it's taking a while to load. Okay, here we go. So that's what the file archive does as far as your payroll archives. Now the pay form archives are basically going to give you every, um, oops, hold on here. What am I doing here? There we go. Payroll. Okay. This is going to give you any uh, pay form, payroll uh, information that was imported from Classic as far as like uh, pay, payroll uh, check information. That will all be put out here in this pay form archive when you import the data. Obviously, I don't have any imported in this test file. But, um, the next option is your W-2 archive. And again, this is going to be used every year when the district processes their W-2s, they're gonna to have to go in and import the W-2 information into this W-2 archive file. And this can also hold anything that came out of Classic. They could import that information into the redesign as well using uh, zip folders or whatever. They could do that. The last one is one we added uh, a while back, but it's really nice, it's called Other. And this will can basically hold any miscellaneous reports that might not be saved during the normal payroll, or if there's just like some report that the district likes to run and they wanna have it on hand to look at, they can go in and actually either create a folder to put that report in or create you know, create a brand new folder and put, you know, put the report under. But I have one out there. I created this folder called Lori's Reports. So if I went into that Lori's Reports, this would allow me to actually go in and, and find if there's a certain report that I want. I could go out there and find this in my directory, wherever it's at. And then I could just load that and put that right in this Lori's Reports option. Again, if I wanted to create a whole new folder to put reports in, I would just hit that create option. Oh, right here, here we go. And then hit the save. When I do that, 
that's going to be put out there on that in that others tab. And I can just go in here and click on it. And then I could go in and like I said, add a file. I could find the, <clears throat> the file that I want, <coughs> click on it. And then it should load that file right into that folder. And it did. So that's what that other option is used for. All right, the next option, option under utilities is the file import. And this could be used again when you're um, importing W2s or maybe your pay slips from uh, Classic. You could uh, create, you could use it, create a zip file to load that data. And it basically, it tells you, you can tell it where you want to load this, whether it be the W2 forms or the, the uh, W2. The W forms of the pay forms folder. And you can uh, process this and then import that data into those particular folders. Or you could, you could import multiple zip files as well. And again, you just have to tell it which folder you're going to be putting them in and then load the file information from there. If uh, you're importing the classic payroll CD, if you want to, if you're importing the whole CD, you can go ahead and, and upload the zip file here and just click the import uh, zip file option. And one thing to note, let me just see here. I know we've got something about that. Where is it? Okay. You could import the payroll CD information from Classic here or there's a, an opportunity to actually import the CD information when you're doing the initial extract from, you, from Classic. So um, you need to use the true option on the Classic USPREXTR.com command procedure. Um, and if you do that, then it will load all of those Classic um, CD archives into the payroll archive files. Um, if you don't want to use the true option, then obviously you're going to have to use this import classic payroll CD archive option. <clears throat> um, let's see what else. Okay, the next option in utilities is a job scheduler. And Lori talked about the job scheduler yesterday, but basically anytime a report or Maybe they set uh, their uh, email direct deposit notices to go out at a specific time. Those are going to be sitting out here waiting uh, to process, or maybe they already processed. If they process, they'll say completed. If it was like your email direct deposit notices that are waiting for a specific date, they're going to show pending. And then the next run date would show, you know, when they have a schedule to run. Um, if there's a if there's an error, if there's a problem with the run, usually you can click on that and it may give you a little bit of information regarding what the problem was, when the process you know stopped or it decided not to quit running. And again, you have the capability of going in. If you created these jobs, you could go in and delete. Maybe. Yeah, it's really slow. <laughs> And double checks and ask you, are you sure you want to delete that? Yeah, I am. Okay. And then you can view a job and also do a modify as well. Wow, everything's going slow. So it must be getting tired. Okay. But that's just the, the job schedule. And like I said, Lori talked about it yesterday. I don't want to, you know, drag it down with that because we already had talked about it. Um, the next option under utilities is your mass loading option. And a lot of districts are using this. It's an, it's an option that will allow you to mass load uh, data like right into the screens for multiple employees. And right now you can mass load into absence, accumulation transactions, adjustment journals, attendance, compensation, Compensation journals, employee, future pay, leaves, payroll accounts, pay distribution, payroll item configuration, payroll item, payroll item error adjustment, 
payroll employer item error, payroll item employer error adjustment, position, position custom date fields, and user adjustment payables ledger. So there's quite a few places where you can use mass load. Now, the, the main thing about mass loading is you have to make sure that the headers are correct on the CSV file. Because if they're not, it will not load the data. So out in our documentation, we have the headers that should be used. Um, a lot of times, if a district wants to maybe upload something to compensations, okay, they could pull up, filter the compensations for what they're looking for, and then create a CSV file using that Excel field names option. And normally, the field name should match what's out in mass load. I would verify to make sure because once in a while, that is not true, but nine times out of 10, they should match. So the header should already be correct on that file. That way you've already got all of the employees, basically you're wanting to make the mass change to. Then it's just a matter of mass change or manually changing the field that you're mass changing on the CSV file. That way you can use the mass, uh, the, the mass load option to load it. And then when you go to mass load, all you do is you choose the file that you're going to be using. The CSV file has to be in CSV format. And then you're going to say where you're actually going to import this to. So like if I was making changes to compensation, I would choose the importable entities compensation. And then I would hit the load option. When you do that, you'll get, um, it'll show you, you know, X amount of records were loaded, X amount of errors. And when you look at the error report, um, you could actually, again, be able to fix the errors right on the error report and then use that file to, to make those changes and, and load those, those changes once you've corrected on the file. Um, in utilities, we have a the payroll item mismatch utility. That is basically used when you're importing a brand new district. You always want to check that. I think we, we do have that out in the uh, post import procedures, but you want to make sure that you look at that because there could be a mismatch maybe in the, uh, the item type or something. So it's basically throwing some payroll items into this area and you'll want to look at that and make the corrections accordingly before the district starts processing your payroll. And then the last option we have out there is this W2 city override option. Oops, I missed one, but we'll go back. And the W2 city override option is used basically, you can create overrides for W2s for cities. And when you're processing the W2 city uh, files, you could use those overrides so like if I hit create, I can put in a name, and then a description, whatever I want, and then include our own records. And then I could go ahead and add, we have like defined options already out there that you can make changes to for the RS fields. So maybe they want, maybe the city wants uh, the tax code, I don't know. So we go in and we say this going to apply to override the value for, to the city for selected tax entity codes or all override values to all cities and all override values only to cities that are selected. And then we could just put in an override value of, I don't know, 400. So then I'm gonna save that. And then when I do that, I can show this override value that I have out there. So when I go, like I said, when I go into W2s to process city W2s for that particular city, I can use that override if I need to. So that's what that W2 override is option is for. And we got to go back to modules because I must have turned on. I did. Huh. And yeah, the tax estimator, let me, let me refresh here. It should be found under utilities. Should be. Let's see. 
Yeah, there it is. Something must have happened. I must have refreshed or something. But a district has the capability, like I had talked about, of going in and actually uh, maybe seeing like what how an employee's taxes would be affected if they made a change, or maybe if they're making more money or something. But I'm going to find the employee. So first, I have to find this employee, and then do the find employee, and then I have to pull in the positions that the employee works. So normally, every Peggy works these two positions. So I'm going to fill the data. This is this filling the data is pulling from the 001 record, et cetera. So maybe I want to go in and I want to change because right now this is all this pay information. But if I want to go in and I want to see, okay, I want to change the marital status to single. If I do that, and I go down here to calculate. What are my taxes going to be? Okay. Now let's go back in. Let's say I don't, I want to change. Let's I want to keep it in Mary. If I hit calculate, what's it going to be if I'm set to Mary? Same thing. Okay. Let's do. Um, exemptions. I have five exemptions. I calculate. Maybe. It's not, it's not calculating. No, hold on here. Go back. There we go. It's just, it's, it's really slow. But the thing about it is you could use this tax estimator to calculate, you know, if the employee asks you, if I did this, what would my taxes be? Anything that you did like the start, the first tax estimate was here. Anything that you've done currently is showing to the left of the, of the screen. So you can definitely use this tax. It's kind of like the uh, tax tab that was out in Classic. So you can use that in and redesign this tax estimator option. All right, last thing we're gonna talk about, and hopefully I can get you out of here by noon. We may go a little over just because we had those few things at the beginning we had to cover, but the last thing we're gonna talk about are the reports. And we do have report bundles, and we have a lot of set report bundles already out there. And what those are basically used for are, um, you know, like payroll, calendar year end data. And you can see, you can't change any of those SSDT report bundles that we have sitting out there. Now, anything that you create as a report bundle, you can change if you want to. You could definitely do that. But um, let's just say, let's just look at this calendar year end bundle. When I look at this, I'm just viewing it. What it's basically telling me is that um, when, I, when I run the calendar year end close event, it's going to trigger all of these reports down here to be ran. And then it's going to send these reports to a specific email address, wherever I tell it to send it to. So if I wanted to create a report one now, I could go to create. And I'll just call it Lori's bundle. Oops. Okay, and then description. I wanted to put some tags on it, I could. And select a report to add to the bundle. I'm just gonna go in, let's just say, what do I want? Let's do, um, Where's the birthday report? Is that on here? Can't find it. We'll do this one. EMIS reportable flag. Okay. So I'm going to go ahead. I want to add this to my bundle. So I had to click it to add this down here to my bundle. If I wanted to add another report, I could do that. Add that down here to my bundle. Once I've done that, once I have all the reports that I want in my bundle, I click save. 
All right. So now I have my bundle saved. I can go in and this basically will allow me to schedule my report bundle. So maybe I want to run this every Friday. Okay, I could do that by setting up a, a Chrome, a Chrome, 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 whatever you call it, expression. So I could put my expression in here. Um, let's see. Let me go out here. I got to look. I'm cheating because I got to look at the Chrome expressions because I don't know what they are automatically. It's pulling it up. Hold on. So let's do every, no, I'm, Specific second. I want to do it every. Every five days, every five days on Friday. I could have just chosen this. This would have been easier Friday. And I want to send this at, let's see, what time do I want? Um, four o'clock in the afternoon. We'll do that. All right. So in order for me to do that, I need to, let's see, where is my little button here? Oh, right here. This created my Chrome expression when I went in here and did this. So I just need to take this. And copy it. Oh, of course, I logged out of my. <laughs> Sorry, I click. I forgot to click the ad. Let me get back in. <clears throat> so I'm going to go in and add that current expression to that report. Maybe. Come on. Oh, my goodness. Here. There we go. Yeah, finally. Goodness, I'm starting to get panicked. All right, so we're going to go back to the reports bundle. And we'll add that current expression to, because we're going to set the time for that bundle to trigger. So every Friday at 4 o'clock in the afternoon is going to trigger, trigger and send that report to whoever I tell it I want to send it to. And way we'll do that is, like I said, we'll go into that little clock looking thing. And then the crown expression, I'm going to paste it in here. And then who, I, who do I want to send this to? I can send it to one person, multiple people, we just by, separate by comma, whoever I want to do. The archive type I have to do do I want to send it multiple notifications in a single attachment or a single notification with multiple attachments? We'll choose that one. I'm going to go ahead and click Save. So when I do that, now every Friday at 4 o'clock, those reports will get sent. If I wanted to send them immediately, I could have just gone in and said, send it immediately. Right here, send it immediately to this person or an event. What event is gonna trigger this? That's like I said, we had that calendar year end event. If I have a report, maybe I'm running the payroll and when I'm, after I run, run payables, I wanna send that, set that event. I could set, you know, the event when, uh, let's see when, let's see what I wanna do. When I run the benefit accrual event, I want this report to get, fired and sent to so-and-so. So I can create the benefit report, benefit accrual report and send them to whomever I want to. So that event would trigger that to send that every time that accrual is ran. So those are the options out there that you can use to create report bundles. And like I said, I have the capability now of going in and modifying and viewing it. I can even delete it if I want to. And then this checkbox means that the, the report bundle is enabled. If I check it and unenable un it, if I can, yeah, there it went. Um, that means that it's not going to work at all. Like the, the, what I had set up, it's not going to fire at all because I don't have it enabled. 
But now if I enable it again, it will. And you do have the capability of going into these SSDT reports and turning them off if you want to. As you can see, you can click the check mark. Or like I said, if I wanted to delete a report bundle, I could just go in and click the X because I created it, I can delete it. All right, the next thing we'll talk about are, is a report manager. And the report manager is what we call the template reports because the reason we call them template reports is because the reports that are out there, like the SSDT created several different reports, but maybe there's something on a report that you don't want, or maybe you want something more if it's if it's available. So let's just go into this SSDT payroll item detail report. If I go into the little eye to view it, I can view that and see all the properties that are currently being pulled into this report. And then if there's a certain sorting order, if they have it configured, I can set it up to look at that. But maybe I'm like, um, I don't really want the certain stop dates. I don't really need those. So I can just go in and take those off. Okay, so I did that. Really everything else on this report, I like it, except I didn't want those start and stop dates on there. What I can do, since this is a template report, I could go in, since I removed those, I could go to the save as, and I could you know, change the name totally, or I could just put dash Lori and save it, click the save option. When, it, when I do that, it tells me that report's been saved then I should be able to go, go in and see that as a DT payroll item detail slash Lori report is out there. I can then run it using that. I could have ran it obviously in there like where I was, but I just wanted you to see that it does actually go back out here. Right here is the one I just created. So then I could you know create it. I had a query, certain payroll items. I could specify those pull those in. Now, the other options here, this is your generate view. This modify will just change the name. You can change the name. So you change that name instead of SSDT, you can change it to payroll Lori. Now I gotta go back up and find it though. There it is. Okay. Um, so I use this modify to do that. If I wanted to delete it, I could since I'm the one that created it. And then if I wanted to, I could download it to save it somewhere. Maybe I want to send this. This is a great report. I want to save this and send it to my friend that works over at the other school or the other ITC. I could do that by just clicking on this download report option. And then it saves it to a folder of mine that I can email it and send it right to that person. And then this option, share the report a definition with roles. If I want to share this with certain people, maybe I only want to share it with people that have group manager access. And let's see what else we want. That looks pretty good. We'll just save it to that one. Then those people can actually see that report if I go in there and save it, give it give access to it to people with certain roles. And then if I wanna make this a, one of my favorites, meaning do I wanna see this on the homepage? When I go into the homepage, if I click that box, if I go back to the homepage, I can see this is one of my favorite reports. And if I wanna show all reports, I would just click all reports and it would show me everything that's out there. But if I only wanna show my favorites, I can see that that Lori, payroll item Lori is one of my favorite reports. All right, we have the custom report creator. Custom report creator, I said that right. Felt like I said that wrong. <laughs> and to, do, to use that, this allows you to actually go in and create your own reports by choosing an object that you're wanting to use to pull in to create a report. 
So maybe I want to use uh, compensation. If I do that, it gives me all the properties that are available for the report. And then you can see that these little arrows here, if I click on it, it expands and it shows other options that are available as well in the properties. So I could pull all that in. And then if I want certain data in my report, all I do is I just go in and I double click it or I can drop and drag. So I'll double click or I can just take and hold it and drag it over. However you want to do it, either way, it's, it's up to you. Maybe I want the number. And then um, let's do last paid date. And then if you configure on the last paid date, it's out there. That's an employee. Mm, where are you? This takes getting used to because you have to know like where the certain fields are at. It's, it's So we could set that up to say equals. And then if you wanted a prompt to actually show up when you're generating, like in the generate the report in the query, you could enter a parameter script. I'll find out real quick here. Oops. And then I'll just try to save it. Okay. So now if I go to generate that report in the query, I have last pay date option here. I could put in pay date and then I can run the report and it should give me the compensation information. That was kind of a dumb thing to use, but I, well, we'll try it. But it just shows you like what you can do and you can set different uh, options. Like if I didn't know how to set up those parameters, I could have just really gone in here. Yeah, that didn't give me much, one person. I could have just gone into that configure filter and I could have just entered the date, just said equals 11, 15, 22 and, and generated it that way if I wanted to. So yeah, there's plenty of different options when you're creating your own customized report. And that's just, like I said, that just takes playing around with and getting used to. It really, really does. And then what we have last out here are called canned reports. So basically these reports are, are out there available, but they cannot be changed in any fashion. Nothing can be changed on them. So this ACH submission, Lori talked about this yesterday when she did the payroll. This is what you use when you're creating your ACH payroll submission or your HSA ACH payroll submission file, that's where that's located. We do have an afford report that is out there. And that afford report is used to basically process to determine if an employee is exceeding 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month, depending on if they're paid, you know, biweekly or monthly. And the district can run this in a text format as well as a CSV format. There's either option at the bottom. And you'll notice it's asking for beginning and ending dates. So they can run you know, every payroll or if they have um, a third, uh, third party vendor that wants this information every month, you know, it's however they want to run it, they can. And they have the capability of excluding any employee that's not there anymore, that's terminated or excluding employees that already have insurance. Because this is kind of what that report was designed for is because it, it's supposed to you know, list any employees that, that went over 30 hours a week or 130 hours a month. Um, so you may want to exclude them. This report is kind of nice to run without excluding them if you wanna see the hours that employees work for particular pay, you can use this report. 
And then you need to calculate based on weeks or months. Again, if they're biweekly, you usually calculate for weeks. Uh, if they're semi-monthly, you choose the month option. And then if there's only a particular pay groups you want, you could select those and pull them over. If there's only a particular employee you want, you could do that and then just click the add option and add that employee here. And then again, you could generate a report or a CSV file, whichever, whichever you're looking for. Um, these two reports here, the Auditor of State reports, are fairly new and they're really nice for the auditors. Um, these were based on data that we got right from the auditors about what information they are wanting when they come and do their audits. So we have one that's the employee report, another one that's the payments report. And again, these are set up just like what the auditor had basically told us. So if there's something missing or, or they want more, they have to talk to the auditors, like the main auditor, and they can tell us that because we set these up according to what they specified. We have the benefit obligation report, and that report can be ran uh, by account or it can be ran by employee. So either way, uh, they can process it however they wish. There's different formats, CSV or PDF that can be used. Uh, they can sort it how they want. There's several different options. Same thing for the employee detail. Uh, the leave type, you know, if they're only one to process it for certain leaves, they can. Do they want all active employees inactive or do they want both? And then they report as of date, you know, as of this day, th these are the, this is the information that we want. Benefit obligation as of this day. And if they want all employees, they, they don't have to do anything with the selected field. They can just leave it blank and then it'll pull a report. It'll pull every employee. If they only want certain employees, they could just double click on them and pull them over and then generate the report. And the same thing goes <laughs> for the employee report as well. So like I said, you have the option to create a by account report or by employee report. The census report, oops, oh, I missed it. Hold on. Oh, I skipped one of the best ones, the audit report. <laughs> and we kind of talked about this the other day a little bit, but this is really nice because if somebody made changes or they want to see who made a change, they can run this report. Um, and you can use specific dates, specific objects, you know, you can narrow it down. Maybe it was just something that was done on a payroll item. You can just pull that over. And then if you have just one certain employee you're looking for, just put that person's name in here or their ID. And then just click add. Then it's only going to run the report for only that employee, which is really nice. So this report is really, really, it's come a long way. And we're still adding things. I know we added some more objects not too long ago. So it's really, really a nice thing. Now we'll go back to the census report. See, that's what happens when I skip around. All right, um, let's see. That's not the one I want. All right, the census report. Um, this is a report a lot of times that um, Ng requires it. So we created this so that it will pull in the information that they're wanting. Um, you could uh, ask for just employees for what they had 403B deductions or just 457 deductions or all both 403B and 457 deductions, or you can just run a census for all the employees. And if uh, the employees have a deduction, that doesn't even populate. Uh, if you want only people that are current, like what, the last paid date, you could enter that last paid date in here. And then if there are specific fields, like we have it defined, I think what, what ING, or ING, ING, I call them ING, ING wants. But if you have some other uh, third party vendor that wants other data, you could pull that data in from the property selection into this uh, selected area and then just generate that file and then generate the file and then you can send it to ING or the other uh, company that they that's wanting it. 
And we do also have this include archive employees and use the defi uh, defined date two for rehire date because um, the, the, the date two field was used for the rehire date um, because we didn't have that field available in classic. So we've just kind of pulled that over into redesign for right now until we actually create like a rehire date field. So right now, if they have a rehire date in that date two field on their record, they can just use that and, and that'll pull in. Another report we have is the CRDC or the Civil Rights uh, Data Collection Report. And this report pulls in specific employees. Uh, we have the different uh, codes, the SCH0043, which are instructional staff. The SCH0044 is a support uh, student service, uh, support services students, support services staff, and support services administration. And then the SCO045 is the instructional staff and the support services student staff. So we have those reports already out there uh, pulling in the data that they are wanting on that civil rights report. And then if you want to generate an error report just to see if there's any errors, you could do that as well by clicking on that uh, generate error box. Uh, the next reports are EMIS reports. And those reports basically are for EMIS data collection. So we have two different reports. We have the uh, employee, hold on here. We're still, yeah, here we go. We have an employee report and a position report. And these reports are set to include anything that the data collector will run or anything the data collector will want. And then if there's any errors that are on the reports that are related to an employee, uh, the there's going to be an error message on the report stating that. So the district can see there's errors and they have to go in and correct those errors before they try to do a collection um, to EMIS. And one thing to keep in mind, uh, em employees' compensation, they cannot be archived for EMIS reporting. They have to be not marked as archived. That is one thing to keep in mind for EMIS. Um, the next report is the earnings register. Uh, and again, this is an important report. District uses it a lot for when people are going to retire to get their total pay information. Uh, and again, uh, you'll see the save and recall. And Andrea talked about this, I think, a little bit. But um, the save and recall uses the most recent parameters that were set up on this screen. If they want to use, just go to the default. It, maybe you can see it blanked out those dates. They could just start fresh and use it how they want to use it as far as the dates that are going to get pulled in. If they wanted to create their own, they could go in and maybe they're just selecting certain, they only want certain pay groups. They could create their own report. I don't know if I can even do that. Uh, you know. Hold on here. Oh, that not working? Hmm. Well, that's not a good example. But again, I would definitely uh, go back to the default so they can make sure that there are no fields populated that they don't want included on the report. That way, they're getting a fresh report where they're entering the in the data themselves. Uh, we talked about the employer distribution report and employer retirement share reports. Uh, Lori talked about those a lot yesterday because those are basically used for the payroll processing. Um, the job calendar report. There have been some uh, little updates made to this report, so it's kind of nice. Uh, this will give you calendars uh, and the work days that are defined on those calendars. So you can go in and choose the beginning date, ending date, or if you only want to find calendars that has certain dates, you can just enter that date in instead. And then you want, do you want a page break on the new job calendar, show job calendar outline? This is kind of one of the new features. And I think it's really cool. I'll leave it marked for now, 
And do we want to exclude archive job calendars? Yeah, we don't want archive jobs. So we're going to go ahead and generate the report. But what this outline does, it's really nice. It actually, pull it up here for you. It puts a box around it. I really like it a lot better than the old way, but it puts a box around every day. And it's, it's, I think it's much easier to read because if we go in and click the show up calendar outline and uncheck it and I process it, I'll show you what, it, you'll see what it looks like. And you, you're very familiar with what it looks like because this is how it used to look. No boxes, just the W's and the dates. But like I said, I really like the outline out feature, but it's strictly up to the districts, how they want to process it, doesn't make any difference. And I know we've had a few issues with, I think it's like, uh, they were they were printing off job calendar because they had one in each calendar on one page and something happened with there was a month it has like five weeks or something and it was it was throwing it off into another page we do have a Jira issue out there I think for that we'll try to get that fixed um let's see the leave balance report is just going to give you all of the employees leave balances. So I could go in and I could sort it by however I want to sort it, name, pay group. Um, do I want a certain type of leave or do I want all leave? Do I want to include ineligible positions? No. Archive? No. Um, maybe certain only certain pay groups. I could do that just by pulling them over to the select area. I'll just go ahead and generate the report. And this is going to give me the leave balances, vacation, sick, personal, for every employee that has leave. So this is really nice. It gives you all the their balances to date. We have a leave projection report. And so basically this is used on the use as, well, leave projection is used on the use as side if they're using leave projection. A lot of districts don't use it, but if they do, they could run this report before they actually process the USAS leave projection to make sure that their totals are matching. And you'll see there's four different reports. There's a message, air message report. Then there's a report that gives you employee detail, um, one that gives you the account detail, and then one that gives you account summary. And to be honest, all three of these, they the dollar amounts on them should match when you're processing it. And again, the, the selected leave types are already defaulted to personal sick and vacation. I know there was an ITC, they had a district who ran it only just separately for holidays. They can do that, it's up to them. However, they wanted to do the leave projections, they can, they can do that. So let me just try, uh, let's see what we get. We'll just try the employee report first. Oh, what's the one on here? Oh, got the slash. All right. So again, some districts may not even be using the projection. Some of them may. It's strictly a district decision whether they want to use it or not. Okay, well, oh, I thought it was finished. Well, that's processing. We'll go back up here and we'll go to the new contract report. And this is basically when you're processing new contracts, it'll give you all the contract information from the new contracts that you have out there right now. And you can see you have certain job calendars and things like that where you can actually process this report if you want to. The page breaking, the subtotaling is all available on this report. Um, next one is the ODJFS reporting. And you can see we have sub reports. We have a, the new hire report. And that's gonna be to report all of your ODJFS new hire employees. So anybody that has is new, newly hired needs to be reported to ODJFS. So they're gonna go in and 
select those employees that need to be reported. Now, this include headers for validation and submission files. That was something we added not too long ago. I think if they were doing validations out on uh, the ODGFS website, that had to be in there. Um, I know I've used it. I just haven't checked. And I can use it and check it and submit, and it submits the file just fine. So checking it does not really hurt anything. So here I could just generate the report so I can look at this report and see who's all going to be submitted to ODJFS on my tape file. So it gives me all the information here. And then I would just go out and create my submission file and then upload it for the new hires. And then again, for ODJFS, we also have the ODJFS report, which they go out and process that every quarter. They're going to go in, obviously, this year is incorrect. The first quarter. And then they may want to sort it by name. And then we can generate the report. They can view that for their totals, their total weeks, you know, whether an employee was reported or not, make sure everything looks accurate before they do actually do the submission file. And this is, again, similar to how Classic works. Nothing really different. It's just a different way of doing it, I guess. All right. Here's our ODGFS report giving us the month, the first month, second month, or so January, February, March, and then the wages, uh, how many weeks were these reported, yes or no? Obviously, like I said, these are test files. So everybody says no. <laughs> no one was reported, right? Because no one was paid in those months. Um, the next option is the payment transaction status report. That's going to give you a list of check numbers, a check status, and the type, um, employee ID or vendor code, depending on if it's a, a check type, uh, the name, all that information, whether it's voided or reconciled. And basically, if you put in a starting date and stop date, and tell which, you know, if you want only certain checks, you can do that. If you do all checks, and then I'm just going to generate this report. It's going to give me a, the transaction status of all these checks. And I, I said all types. I didn't do like deduction manual. I just pulled everything. See if, yeah, we got information on here. And so it gives you like the voided date, reconciled date, all that information. Okay. That report is still running. Must be a big report. Um, the perfect attendance report can be ran. I think this is similar to the ABS 003 in Classic. So basically, that's going to be ran to give you. Um, a report for anyone that has not missed any days in the category that you selected. So, it's like a sick personal professional. Uh, you enter in specific days or if you want a single day, however you want to run it. You know, again, your different options as far as an eligible job as employee ID, if you want to show that on the report. If you want to run it by specific pay groups, you can do that as well. Okay, we've got our quarter report. Again, very similar to classic. Uh, you just have to make sure you've got the right year and the right quarter selected. And you sort it however you want to sort it. it gives you the report information. And you use that for your balancing. And you, you're familiar with the quarter reports. I mean, usually, you know, every quarter they balance it to the W-2 report, the totals as far as the payroll items and, and things like that. Make sure all their, their, their total gross and things like that all match. And even when you're importing districts, um, a lot of districts are using the quarter report, making sure that there's totals that match. And then you have your 941 information on the bottom of the, of the quarter report, that your grand totals for your payroll item deductions, your total summaries, you know, if there was a difference, you'd have a, a message down here showing you differences. 
dollar amount differences. The SERS reporting, we have several sub reports. We have the SERS monthly report. Oh, whoops, go back to that first. And this is just to give them information from month for the employee. So we'll just, I'll just go ahead and run it. Like I said, I don't know if I have anything since I don't think I've paid anyone. We'll go look. But they can run this report every month. Well, that's processing. Oh, the lead projection finally finished, hooray. <laughs> So you can see there's quite, there's errors. So all those errors, and like I said, this district is not a good one to example, but any errors would have to be cleaned up, you know, before they actually uh, do the lead projection and use as integration. So let's go to this monthly report here. And that's just, this gives us, hey, they do have some stuff in there. Monthly earnings, the deposits, the pickup, Everything that was regarding their um, the retirement, their SERS retirement, gives us all that information and totals on the bottom. Um, we also have the new hire report. So any employee that on the 400 record that has the new employee box checked would be showing on this screen, on this new hire screen. So right now I don't have anyone. But if I had someone that had that was marked new employee on that 400 record, they would be showing up here. And again, this allows you to change this report name if you want to. You can leave it as your new hire report, but that's the default. Then generate the report or generate the file, however you want to do. And then when you've generated the file, you're going to upload it to the ESERS website. And then we have the per pay file, which is Every payroll, they process uh, SERS per pay, so they can get a file that shows the contributions um, and the days that they work, and that gets uploaded to the ESERS website. And this information has to be populated, the date, cycle, code, start and stop dates. And you can see down here the historical payrolls, so you can see start and stop dates, you know, so you wouldn't have to, if you couldn't remember the start and stop dates, you wouldn't have to go back to the payroll processing. You can actually just scroll down and see that here. And then the last thing under SCR's reporting is the SCR surcharge report. And that surcharge report, um, it gives you calculations that you can save on the report because you may get a bill from SCRS um, regarding surcharge. And I think they also can use it for gap reporting as well. So it's kind of a twofold. You can use it for two different things, but they would just go in um, usually, I think this is at the end of the fiscal year, they would go in and just generate and create this report and then save it uh, for the auditors. And then again, if, if SERS sends you a bill, you can kind of compare it and make sure everything matches. The STRS reporting, we have the check STRS advance, which is used if you're finished with uh, the advanced processing over the summer months, and your advance is off, this report can be ran because this will show what was paid through advance for each employee. And they can, the district can take this report and compare it to their original SCRS advance report and find the differences and see who, you know, didn't pay enough or wasn't paid, didn't, was paid too, didn't pay enough or paid too much. So you can use this report to do that. Then we have the SRS advance report. That report, again, is usually ran at the end of the fiscal year because that is used to set, uh, we're going to basically set all SRS employees in advance, meaning they're getting paid over the summer months. We have to tell SRS how much we're going to be paying for, each, you know, for the contributions for the you know, four pays or three pays that they're being paid in, at the advance. So you can see we have different reports out here. We have the advanced fiscal year to date report, which is a report with everyone. We have the advanced positions report, which is only positions that are being advanced. 
and we have the advanced, the non-advanced position. So basically anyone that's not advancing. Then we also have the generate submission tab. So they're going to be running these reports, making verifications, and then when everything is correct, they'll create the submission file. Now they can um, go in and choose the file and submit it then to STRS if it's if it's all set. If they have third party data, maybe like from Ren Hill or some other third party that where they have employees that are, are paid by Ren Hill, but they need to include them on their file, you have to get the, the district has to get the files from that third party uh, entity in the correct format. And then what they're going to do is they're going to take their STRS file that they created here and they're going to up they're going to merge that file with the, the file that they basically got from that third party entity. And they're going to do that. So they're going to choose the file from uh, the advanced file that they created. Then they're going to choose the third party entity file. Then they're going to um, merge the files and then generate the STRS merge report. When all that data is, is created, when the merge is done and they create the STRS merge file, that's the file then that they're going to want to upload to STRS because it's got that contains the third party data as well as their own, own data. So they have to remember that. The other STRS report option is the new hire. And the new hire is the same as SERS. If the new employee box is checked on the 450 record, that employee will show up here. The, the only other option in this is you have a capability of generating the report first to verify. Then you can either generate the submission file and save it to a folder of your choosing, and then later choose that file and submit it to STRS. Or you can use this generate submission file and submit to STRS all in one swoop, do both things at one time. It's up to the district, however they want to do it. So that options are, those options are available. And the last one is the STRS per pay, very similar looking to the SERS per pay. Um, the nice thing is, again, all of the payrolls are down here. So you could go in and, whoops, you're going to select the payroll that you're wanting to run this for. A little different than SERS. You select the payroll you're wanting to run this for. You can generate a report. Verify it, verify contributions, hour or not hour, days. And then when everything looks good, again, you have the capability of going in and just creating the file, saving it, and then later on choosing the file and submitting it. Or you could just do it one swoop where you generate the file and submit it to STRS. Again, district preference, it's up to them how they want to do it. We have the wage obligation reports. We have the uh, report you can process it by wage obligation account or wage obliga obligation employee. And again, they would just have to fill out all the information, the parameters on the report, how they want to process it. This is the employee option here. Hold on, that's still, a, here we go, that's employee option. And like I said, they could select just certain employees if they wanted to, if they had to. Choice is up to them. And the last one is your W-2 report and, and submission. And here we have the capability of just running a report for W-2s. Make sure your year is correct, obviously. Um, we have the capability of creating the submission file. And again, there's certain submission file options down here. You can create your file for SSA, your W-2 submission file summary report, you get your CCA submission file, and then a summary report for CCA, a RITA submission file, and a RITA submission summary report. And again, we talk about all of this at calendar year end. We do have a forms option. Currently, you can't print the forms out and give them to the employees. But if you had, uh, an, like maybe you needed to send forms to a city, maybe they're not submitting electronically, they have two people. You could go in and just print out forms for certain employees by just going and choosing forms 
and then type in the employee ID or name and then just click add. And now you have to do is generate the W-2 forms and it would just print out those particular employees. And then we also have the XML option, which is used for uh, the uh, printing software to print the W-2s. Basically, get the file and then, and then load it to the printing software so you can uh, actually print the forms out. I think that is everything. I know reports, I kind of went through it quickly, but a lot of them I know you're probably already familiar with, but I just wanted to make sure we got through everything um well not in time i'm i always go over i don't know what it is about me but i always seem to go over but i just wanted to make sure you got all the information you needed and are there any questions while we're waiting here we got a minute if anybody has questions i'm willing to go back to something if you want to go over it just let me know no questions um i really appreciate everybody tuning in today have a great weekend and don't forget to set your clocks ahead. We're springing ahead Saturday night. So um, enjoy your weekend and thanks again for tuning in. Much appreciated. Talk to you later.